we help fund, build, and localize tech startups in the world's most promising regions. Cinefy is a one-stop solution for tech companies trying to make sense of China and Southeast Asia. Check out more at cinefy.group. Welcome to the Theta Network. Earn T-Fuel crypto rewards simply by watching live streams and videos. As you watch and share with others, you're contributing to the decentralized Theta Network, all powered by Theta's native blockchain. Discover the future of video delivery at thetanetwork.org. and bulls are the two driving forces of the crypto market depending on who buys and who sells the bear is superpower is to make money even when the market is down their strategy is selling short and provoking a supply increase the bull the whole bull's life is dealings for a rise his main goal is a growing market bull is optimistic and pluckily beats first The confrontation of bulls and bears lasts forever, and as its price depends on who leads the fight.
Exip ecosystem is designed to decentralize the internet and overcome monopolistic control over domain names and top-level domains. A blockchain DNS solution where agnostic NFTs preferred by you identifies your domain and top-level domain. Exip token is an agnostic usage and governance token released initially based on the Binance chain. Exit tokens will be used to buy, sell and auction domains at top-level domains, while token holders will get staked when domains and TLDs are purchased and auctioned. Revenue generating methods don't allow publishers and businesses to offer an enjoyable, ad free browsing experience. We need a new solution that brings everything together to benefit businesses and users alike. That's why we made Gather. Gather is a blockchain based network that improves the online experience for users, generates additional revenue for publishers, reduces cloud computing costs for enterprises, and makes running a proof of work blockchain easier. Instead of spamming users with ads to generate revenue, Gather runs in the background of your site and with each user's consent, aggregates their idle processing power. Then it distributes said power to enterprises for cloud computing and to developers for cryptocurrency mining. Publishers receive payment in cryptocurrency or fiat, users get to enjoy an ad-free browsing experience, and developers deploy their secure blockchains without the need to find new miners. Ultimately, it's a virtuous cycle that radically changes digital monetization and revenue generation to provide a superior experience for the end user. Join Gather today to be a part of the future. We help fund, build, and localize tech startups in the world's most promising regions. Cinefy is a one-stop solution for tech companies trying to make sense of China and Southeast Asia. Check out more at cinefy.group. Hello, dear participants from Viewers of Synopsis 2021 Edition 3. Uh, as you may remember, my name is Maxim Sofanasek, and I'm the CEO of the Libre Group in Coindar, and I'm the host of the Synopsis Summit. Today, my co-hosts are unbelievable Amersan Roberto, the co-founder and angel investor of Synopsis Group. Amazing Nastya Adamova, so CEO and CEO at Synopsis Group. And Gorgeous Tanya Vasinina, head of CIS partnership at Sinophy Group. As you know, Synopsis 2021 offer a full immersion in the digital economy, DeFi, and NFT. Our official streaming partner is Zeta TV. Today, Zeta Drop stars a mystery box auction of exclusive Synopsis NFTs. Don't miss it. These tokens are a collaboration between the Zeta Labs team and Alan Bell, the official artist of our summit. Synopsis will also issue special edition NFTs tied to the official merchandise and our official dream, Port of Royal Rome. Synopsis is organized by the International Blockchain Consultancy Calibri Group, the leading cryptocurrency calendar, Coindar.org, and Synophy Group. Summit so organizers are the Commission on Blockchain Technologies and Digital Economy of the All Russian Public Organization Investment Russia and popular YouTube channels, Cryptos and Sexy BDC. I would like to thank our diamond sponsors who contributed a lot to holding this event. Algorand and Arpa Chain are among the world's largest DeFi and NPCs companies. The gold sponsors made no less of contribution. There are Gazer, Bella Protocol, CPI Technologies, Biconomy, and Veracity. We send special thanks to all of our friends and partners who also put a lot of efforts to make Synopsis happen. They are Exmo, Zeta Network, and Zeta TV, of course, <laughs> Freeton, Ton Labs, Delio, Blockster, PR.io, Astar, DigiDAO, DAO.vc, Bing Crypto, Pingbon, J2TX, Trustbase, Gate.io, and of course, Binance. <laughs> so let's start. Amerson Roberto opens the day with an interview with Harley Zatino, founding partner at Neo Lego. Um, 
hello and thank you for joining us. This is my very pleasure to welcome Harla Zepino, the founder and partner at Neo Legal. Um, the, the team specializes in blockchain technology, cryptocurrency, corporate advisory, and financial services. Harley, the list of accolades is really huge. Out of curiosity, how did you end up in blockchain and cryptocurrency? Um, so basically, I started in 2015. I'm a, I'm a gamer. Um, so basically, I had a graphics card. Wasn't doing anything, so I started mining um, with my graphics card, as a lot of people have done. And uh, from there, I basically um, got more and more interested with cryptocurrency um, because I was mining Bitcoin. Then I started mining Ethereum and I was mining Red Coin, Sia Coin, stuff like that. Um, so basically, that was my introduction into cryptocurrency. That's kind of interesting because most of the miners that I could think of, they became traders. But in fact, once you started mining and then you had that sort of migration towards the legal aspect of the business, do you happen to have some kind of story or inspiration or motivation? How, what, what is the sort of story in between and how did you end up starting your own company versus working for the corporations that could pay you zillions in terms of their capacity? Look, um, oh, first of all, I'm not very good at technical analysis. Um, I, I can read it, but... Uh, when it comes to luck, luck is never on my side. So I have to work hard. <laughs> um, in relation to uh, my journey, so basically I started, uh, like I said, I started mining and then I moved into actually advising on cryptocurrency projects. Um, I started advising, advising, um, and then basically um, my tech, uh, my tech knowledge was also uh, solid as well. I, I don't want to talk myself up, but um, so from there, I combined that with my legal degree. Um, I started working in a company that did a little bit of blockchain and then I helped build that uh, process, um, but they weren't specialized in cryptocurrency and blockchain. So basically I came out and said, look, there's no one else that is specializing in cryptocurrency and blo blockchain specifically in terms of a law firm. So um, I ended up opening up my own law firm and basically, what, we're, what we hope to do is become sort of like a PWC or a Deloitte of cryptocurrency and blockchain where we provide a one-stop shop for everything. So that, sounds, that, that, sounds, that, that sounds kind of interesting. In other words, if anybody wants to tokenize their industry or their company or anything what they have in mind, sort of move from traditional business practices, break business practices and become, become part of this blockchain revolution or DeFi, you are the person they could go to and you could build the architecture, business processes, business model, and advice on financial modeling and probably did introductions if I'm correct in understanding. Yeah, so it's everything. So we do uh, build the tech architecture, we build the um, tokenomics, we do the tech itself, uh, get the audits done, um, uh, accounting, etc. So we, we have the whole package. That's fantastic. Well, out of curiosity, um, within five to seven years of, of, of your professional career, obviously you have worked with probably dozens, if not more projects. Um, what are the sort of shining examples that could, you could think about? So you, 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 you start working with a startup and they became, they were this small kind of David and Goliath situation and then you helped them out and they made it, they made it you know, to the world stage. Um, would you please share with a couple of examples? Um, so, uh, like, there's a few, few. We have a few good ones. Um, so, Metex uh, is one. It's a tokenized uh, real estate, uh, tokenized gold, um, and they're really building traction, etc. Um, I have a few other projects cooking right now, which are quite big, but they're blue. All I can say is blue label sports clubs, um, and then I also have a few. Um, Oh, how, how do I say this without giving it away? Uh, all, all I can say is blue blue chip clients. Um, and like in, in terms of startups, uh, there, there have been a few along the way that have made a lot of money. Um, and it has made me a lot of money um, because I've advised and whatnot. Um, I guess uh, some of the cool projects I'm working on now is Red Fox Labs, which is quite large. Um, and there's another cool one called, uh, it, it's still up and coming, um, Bad Days. 
uh, Bad Days NFTs, um, which is really exciting, built by Stanley. Um, or the intellectual property was built by Stanley. So yeah, um, th th those are some of the cool things coming up. Well, that's the good thing that you did touch based, uh, based on the um, NFT. I'm going to come back to that point, but I want to pick your perspective because blockchain and DeFi and NFTs are completely new sort of ideas. Um, how does the um, legislation work around these um, industries? How does the Australian government regulations work? How do the Americans work around it? Is there sort of universal legislation that can be applied? Um, look, in most scenarios, a lot of the legislation in terms of security law is quite common um, across all jurisdictions. Uh, so there is a lot of common um, traits that security security laws have. Obviously, each jurisdiction is somewhat specialized, but you can sort of establish a broad framework for each jurisdiction um, across the world. So um, in terms of the Australian government um, or law in itself, basically what you have to fit all these new products under is existing law. So a lot of the existing law actually take a lot of uh, cryptocurrency related stuff into consideration. Um, and basically why a lot of regulators um, haven't really hammered down on a lot of DeFi projects and whatnot is because they're taking advantage of loopholes. Because obviously the legislation is quite old and uh, it doesn't take into consideration this new technology as, as normal, right? Um, as anything happens. So a lot, of, a lot of the DeFi protocols and whatnot actually fall under existing legislation, um, especially in Australia. Okay. Do you think any kind of changes would come along in the long run while these NFTs are popping all over or they would stick to their current existing laws? And, and, and then um, what, what do you think would probably happen in terms of its legislation? Not only towards the NFTs, but the DeFi and the blockchain. Yeah, 100, 100%. Look, I think we're going to see um, a lot harsher uh, legislation surrounding on and off ramps. Um, so basically crypto to fear and fear to crypto. Um, and we'll see a lot of, uh, we'll see a lot of legislation surrounding DeFi as well. Um, so reporting requirements, um, advertising to retail investors, etc. cetera. Uh, so the governments, a lot of people think that it can't be controlled at all, cryptocurrency, but the governments can actually control it with the off and on ramps. Um, however, in, in a few years, right, uh, when we, we might move into a completely crypto-based system, um, and in that scenario, that's when it becomes difficult for the government to control. But now when you have to pay your taxes and your groceries and your every, everyday living expenses in fiat, currency, um, the government can control us and can control our spending habits. So for example, if they said, hey, we're banning all crypto to fiat um, transactions, you've wiped out 75% of crypto users, unfortunately. Um, so uh, that, that, that's the sort of uh, thing I think that we're heading to. That would be kind of interesting, definitely in the long run to explore sort of um, philosophy of it and utopia that is sort of shaping and the, um, the global community around which the NFTs are taking completely different form and shape. But mm. going back to the NFTs, um, so NFT industry is a rising beacon in crypto right now. Yeah. Um, why, do, why do you think personally NFTs matter? And why did NFTs become so trendy and, and, and so famous? Uh, look, NF NFTs are an amazing tool. Um, I think a lot of people don't actually realize, but NFTs are just a tool, right? What they do is allow us to own a digital product. Never before have we been, have we been able to, as a society, as a human society, specifically own a digital product and prove our ownership over that. So for example, you have a Word document, right? I can draft up a contract, pop it in a Word document, um, but then someone can just copy it and they can copy it again and again and reshare it. Whereas an NFT, yes, you can copy the image itself. Um, I, I, look, I, I, mean, I can copy your, your image right now, copy and paste, but it doesn't belong to me. And I can't show that your face is owned by me. But with an NFT, if you put that in an NFT and you sell it to me, I can prove that your face belongs to me. So, so it's a very powerful tool. And I only see it getting bigger and bigger. Um, 
and there's a lot of use cases, music, movies, whatnot. Well, I totally see this valid proposition for celebrities, for, for those people that have big names out there. But for, how about the middle class people like myself, um, our team members? How can we benefit from NFTs except for being a consumer or buying this famous sort of artworks or movies or, or soundtracks? Look, any business can actually implement NFTs. So any product and service can actually be tokenized as an NFT. And, and this is where I see um, very big value being generated. So for example, if I own a, let's, let's say a, a law firm, right? Um, one of my services might be draft a service agreement. So what I'll do is I'll tokenize that uh, token of a service agreement and then I'll put it on the marketplace and allow someone to buy it. Now, someone can buy it initially. Um, and if they think there is more value to it, if they think my service uh, drafting skills is better than, let's say, $2,000, um, they might sell it on the market and someone might buy it for $5,000, right? So it's price discovery of services. Like, it, it, that's, that's absolutely huge. Um, so you, you see that cryptocurrency in an order book, right? You can see um, that the price is fluctuating in accordance to what people think it's worth. Now imagine applying that concept to services and goods. Now, retailers don't set the price anymore, the customers set the price, um, which, which I think is crazy. It is, it is. Um, that's kind of interesting example that you gave. For example, you can take my snapshot or a screenshot of this conversation, and then you could go ahead and do the, the mint the NFT, and then you can sell to somebody else. But obviously, if I'm not happy with this kind of thing, um, do we have any kind of intellectual property related challenges or issues? Do I have any kind of legal right according to Australian laws or any kind of laws to go ahead and sue just because you took the screenshot and decided to mint the NFT and sell it to somebody without my consent? 100%. In every country, you can, um, you can basically put a cease and desist and say, look, you're using my intellectual property. You're using my copyright. Please take that down. And then you can go take them to court for that. So... Uh, with NFTs right now, they're on IPFS. Um, so there is a way to take them down. The token might not be deleted, but the image attached to it can be deleted still. But out of curiosity, um, I do, excuse me for my naive questions. It's just, um, I'm looking at my audience and I'm looking at myself. I'm not an aggressive NFT person, but let's say you take the screenshot, you decided to mint NFT, you sell to somebody, somebody yes. decided to resell to hundreds of other people. And all of a yes. sudden, this image is taken down. So what happens to capital that was spent on these images, on, on this particular image, image, and so many people participating in the marketplace? 100%. So you have to go to the source. So Amir, that person that took your picture and used it um, without your permission, uh, basically, it's their fault. And you, you would sue. And everyone that bought it from them would sue that person as well. However... In this space, obviously, you need to be diligent as a consumer. Um, you need to make sure, well, it, it, it's ideal that you make sure as a consumer that whatever you buy, there's intellectual property rights attached to it. So, for example, um, I, I can see Pokeballs and whatnot on OpenSea, right? That They don't have the copyright to those Pokeballs. So they're, they ha they're not entitled to create them. There are exemptions like parody and whatnot. Um, so you can create a parody of an image and sell that and commercialize that. Um, but if it's specifically your intellectual property, Emir, um, and I've actually taken that and put it on OpenSea, then you come and sue me. Whoever's bought it will come and sue me as well. Um, basically, that's how it will work. Well, that's kind of interesting because OpenSea is one of the probably the most famous NFT marketplaces. So how about other marketplaces that may exist are doing a good job? And where it's all are heading, are they going to be more and more marketplaces popping up, trying to compete in just like they did back in search engine kind of era? There was a Yahoo, there were, Google popped up at the end, like 2000 something, but Yahoo was a leading example of the search. Are we, in your opinion, in the same kind of era where there will be more and more marketplaces, they end up suing each other, and NFTs will be sort of, uh, artists would be sort of thinking where to go and, and sort of showcase their works. Or as an NFT artist, I could showcase my work at OpenSea and some other marketplaces. 
hundred percent. There's going to be more and more marketplaces coming through. It's like, it's like eBay and Amazon, right? Um, their marketplaces, and you you see other marketplaces popping up, trying to compete against each other, AliExpress and whatnot. Each one has its niche. Um, but if you use the Yahoo and Google example, right, it came down to user interface. I don't want to talk badly about uh, OpenSea, but right now the user interface is still very clunky in comparison to what maybe we could do in five years time um, with uh, techn technological advancements and whatnot. But the user interface is nice and smooth for a user. And then also what you have is um, the advance of blockchain technology itself. So for example, we have layer two solutions like Polygon. Now, a lot of people don't touch Polygon because it's difficult to buy uh, Polygon, uh, Matic ETH as well as um, Matic itself. And that creates a barrier to entry. So maybe later down the track, um, a layer two solution will pop up. A new marketplace will be built around that layer two solution that everyone uses that has mass adoption, um, like Google, right? Uh, before it was fractured, but now the majority of people, I think I'm comfortable to say are using Google. So okay. Yeah. Okay. That, that really helps. So if I go back and look from the perspective of, uh, 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 let's say average user of, of crypto or cryptocurrency or average user of NFT, just a simple person who consumes content or the information or participates in trading. So if I want to create some kind of NFT, what kind of legal considerations I should think of before, before minting NFT and start selling? Yep, look, uh, biggest, biggest thing with NFTs is intellectual property. You must have the intellectual property. If you're not sure whether you have the intellectual property rights to create that, go see a lawyer or don't do it at all. Um, so intellectual property is um, by far the biggest consideration. Other considerations is dependent on the jurisdiction you're in or the country you're in is taxation. So NFTs, a lot of people don't realize are considered a uh, goods, uh, goods or service, right? Um, so there is, uh, so in Australia, it's called goods and service tax. Um, in other countries, it will be called VAT, right? So on that, when you sell that good or when you sell that NFT, you need to actually take away that five to 10% and put it away for the taxation office. So it's not a digital currency. You're not trading in digital currency. Um, it won't be treated as a digital currency. It'll be treated as a digital product. So for example, say selling a game on Steam or whatnot, it's the very same concept. So those are the two biggest things that you should probably take into consideration um, when setting up a NFT or selling an NFT. Okay, so on one hand, I see the value for celebrities, as I was saying earlier, or people who have achieved something and they have a massive followership. On the other hand, it gives the power back to the content creators. Mm -hmm. So my question is, um, what other current NFT projects that you believe have some kind of social impact that have some kind of long lasting impression rather than benefiting from growing affluence within the industry. Yep, um, so uh, I, I'm a big supporter of this and it's the metaverse. Um, so a metaverse each, uh, well, it doesn't need NFT implementation, but the way that the crypto space is implementing it where people can own pieces of land or shops or whatnot is basically, um, is basically one of the biggest things that I see coming through. Um, and basically in the metaverse where it, it's just the creation of a digital universe basically. Um, so the use case of a digital universe is endless. We can do everything and anything on there. So you can see casinos and whatnot are being built in the central land. People are chilling in the central land, having fun. Um, I think the other week there was a Snoop Dogg party. <laughs> on sandbox that was pretty cool and interesting but um look metaverse is the place to be look at covid has shown that we do need a digital space a digital space um when we're stuck at home a lot of people want to be out and about some people want to stay in their home it's just access being able to access everything from your home um it, it, it's a huge technological advancement in my opinion 
Well, interestingly, there are more and more NFT projects, and I remember reading about Snoop Dogg too, which 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 was kind of really interesting <laughs> study. And um, you are a part, one of the uh, leading legal associates at Marhaba DeFi, which is Sharia compliant uh, a DeFi project and a sort of ethical, inclusive, and very unique project. Um, Sharia is a completely different industry. And, and DeFi, by definition, is, is entirely based, at least based my understanding on interest, based on my research of most cases that I have seen. Um, and that is the NFT marketplace that the team is building. Um, your personal opinion, how does the NFT, Sharia compliance and DeFi, and how does that work in the context of legalities? Because um, um, Marhaba DeFi is incorporated in Australia. Mm -hmm. so, so basically the first thing, I'll, I'll start with the NFT marketplace. Um, so a lot of, a lot of uh, NFTs right now that are coming out, actually not Sharia compliant. Uh, you cannot participate in them. Uh, the reason being is because they use generative art. Um, so basically, just a quick explain on generative art is when you have different traits and they, um, when you mint, they come out at random. So you don't know. Um, I'm not a Sharia expert, but this is what um, my betters have told me from the Mahaba team, that anything that is uncertain um, will likely not be Sharia compliant. And that includes generative art. So basically, um, people that uh, follow that Islamic faith cannot participate in generative art or um, NFT projects along those lines. So basically what Mahaba is doing is becoming the gatekeeper and saying, look, um, we, we will screen these people and ensure that whatever you buy is Sharia compliant. Um, so you can buy without having the worry of actually trying to assess yourself or you don't need to go to a scholar and say, can I buy this? Um, you don't need to use your Sharia scholars as a financial advisor, basically. Um, so in terms of legalities, um, everything, everything is quite similar uh, on that point. Um, it's more so on the Sharia compliance um, and ensuring that everything is, I guess, in accordance to that uh, particular mandate. However, it's very important to know that it's not, it's not um, this platform itself, it's not specifically for people of the Islamic faith. It's for everyone. All it does, what it's trying to do is also include people of the Islamic faith. So um, in, a, in a normal product, we might have the whole world minus the Islamic faith. Um, However, what Mahab, Mahaba does is have the whole world, including the Islamic faith. So it's, um, it's quite interesting. And I think it's a very inclusive um, product in itself. Interesting. interesting. Well, there's one more additional question sort of driven by the curiosity because Mahaba DeFi by definition is part by Sharia compliance and, and company is incorporated in Australia. How does Sharia legislation integrate or interact with the Australian regulation, if I may ask that way? Yeah, well, 100%. Look, um, I've drafted a few contracts and um, there's been quite a few amendments. Um, it, it's been able to fit in. Um, there is some things that I've needed to completely restructure because of the Sharia compliance aspect, um, but there hasn't been too many problems um, in terms of that. But I can say that um, normally drafting a contract, uh, whether, whether you're in Australia or whether you're in any other jurisdiction, um, will be very different or somewhat different um, when you need to take into Sharia um, considerations. Uh, because you cannot, so for example, if I need to draft a loan agreement, um, I, I can't generate, the, the other party can't generate any interest or anything along those lines. They need to know when there can't be any uncertainty. So I can't use any broad terms. My terms have to be very specific and straight to the point, um, which in a way is very good. And um, I, I guess uh, a good contract is very specific. Um, but sometimes when I want to keep it broad, I can't really do that. So um, uh, it, it can be challenging for me uh, okay. at times. Yeah, but still, it's still, it's still, still good. <laughs> well, uh, again, I 
uh, Marhaba is the first project that I have seen being incorporated in Australia. Most of the projects as you know, uh, they, they just Singapore or Dubai or island countries. Um, when anyone is interested in incorporating, when they want to start a DeFi project or any kind of marketplace, um, in your opinion, um, what are the things that people have to look at? Is there a sort of fact checklist or things that they have to tick saying this is the good place to start a company? How does that work? How would you sort of advise our audience on that? Look, um, when you're picking a uh, jurisdiction to set up your DeFi project or cryptocurrency project in, the first thing you should look at is basically how, how friendly is the jurisdiction towards um, doing that. Um, and, and in my opinion, Australia is extremely friendly. Um, because what we use is existing legislation and the ex Australian existing legislation generally fits most things in the cryptocurrency space under the legislation already. So it's very friendly and we have a very strong infrastructure already. However, the second thing you need to have a look at is taxation and Australia <laughs> is quite heavy on taxation. So you're looking at 26% uh, corporate tax. Uh, which is quite high in comparison to most jurisdictions. And that's why you see uh, a lot of people actually setting up in um, Singapore or Dubai, uh, BVI, um, some of the weird little countries, as uh, the, the smaller countries um, in, in the Caribbean, et cetera, and whatnot. But what the advantage Australia has is if you set up in Australia, people trust you. They know that you are, you are bound you are bound by the law and basically everything is generally above board. Um, whereas if you set up in a country like the BBI where there's zero tax, they're a tax haven. But as an investor, you're just not sure, is this company going to do a rug pull? Are they going to run away? I don't know. Because in terms of legislation and um, pinning people down, BBI is still a little bit uneasy. Um, so th those, those are the considerations that you should take when setting up. Well, that's kind of interesting first fact check in terms of the Australian benefits and the getting credibility of potential investors. Well, what are the other things that you could recommend whenever anybody is interested in starting any kind of DeFi project? Um, what are the things that you could advise on sort of must do kind of things? So first one is about the selection of the jurisdiction. So you give one example of the... Um, tax heaven free region. And then you give an example of Australia, despite its corporate 28% tax, but it gets the credibility. In this case, Marhaba has decided to get incorporated. And obviously you were one of the commanders in, in helping to set up. Uh, what are the other things that <clears throat> you would recommend for DeFi startups to consider before they actually start legally getting into the space? Look, um, a big one is token economics. Um, token economics, uh, does play a small part on the legal side, but it plays a big part on the economic side. Uh, what I recommend is you actually, or well, as a as a project, you actually really consider the the benefits and the consequences of the tokenomic structure, um, because this will affect everything else later down the line. So yes, you have one jurisdiction, um, then you look at your tokenomics, but next is trying to capital raise. And if you do not have a good tokenomic uh, structure, it's going to be very difficult for you to capital raise. So going out to VCs, ensuring that they will um, provide, well, invest in your project or invest in your token. Um, you need to also consider uh, whether, whether your token or releasing your token is legally compliant. Because in a lot of situations, uh, in a lot of jurisdictions, prior to actually releasing your token or selling your token to anyone, you need to have your platform up. Otherwise it becomes a managed scheme um, or, a, or a unit trust in a lot of jurisdictions. So basically it becomes a security if you don't have your platform up prior to selling your tokens. Um, so that's a big consideration uh, when setting up your cryptocurrency or DeFi project. So have your platform up before you raise capital. Um, there are ways around it, um, but that's probably something uh, we probably talk in another, have a, have a chat about in another conversation.
That's fantastic. Well, if I could go back to specifics about the economic structure, how does the good economic structure differ from the bad one? How do we know that? Because it's all about numbers. Look, um, so what you to, to know between a good tokenomic structure and a bad tokenomic structure, you need to be able to assess um, the impact of the public sale. So a bad tokenomic structure will not consider the impact at the public sale. So if a price, if your um, tokenomic structure goes below or there's a good chance, there's a high risk that it will go below the public sale price, um, you have a bad tokenomic structure you need to ensure that your tokenomic structure remains uh, above your public sale price at all times if possible. And you need to do whatever you can to ensure that. And whether that's releasing um, tokens at a slower rate via a vesting schedule, or whether that's creating announcements, sur uh, creating announcements surrounding big releases, um, uh, big vesting schedule releases. Uh, another thing is token price. Uh, public perception is a big thing. So, for example, you need to take into consideration are people more likely to invest in a token that's worth one dollar, or you more like, or are they more likely to invest in a token that's one cent? Um, so, a lot of these psychological considerations are actually very valid in this space. Very, very valid. Um, I know for a fact that people will prefer the one cent token over the one dollar token. Um, the market cap might be exactly the same but the one cent token will still be bought up because people feel more powerful if they have more tokens. So they would much rather have 50,000 tokens as opposed to 5,000 tokens. Okay, and as a concluding question, and then I let you give us sort of ideas for um, next generation entrepreneurs, that are extremely crypto friendly or interested in starting their projects. Where do you think the entire DeFi industry is going? Because it reminds me of .com era when every single day you would see a new startup popping up, going to invest a raising the capital. And then the next five to 10 years, they were wiped out because of the bubble. Do you think personally, um, that's the sort of in core that we're going to have? Or there would be sort of evolution that we might not be aware of given the fact that more people are connected online 60 to 70 percent of the globe has an access to the mobile phone and um rising of africa the the power that india brings on the table obviously china's rising dominance so there are so many complexities so in your opinion the DeFi, the nfts the blockchain overall adoption which way it's a heading look i i, I think this is all going to get stronger and stronger i don't see a crash um so like you said before emir your um your example of Africa and other third world countries. A lot of those people don't have access to banking. Um, they have savings, but they have nowhere to generate an interest rate. So now all you need is a phone. All you need is a phone and you can put your savings in your phone or in your wallet. And basically you can start generating interest. You don't need a bank's approval. You don't need people telling you what to do. If you want to take out a loan, you can do so. Um, so look, the biggest adoption of cryptocurrency is in third world countries. And you see um, uh, uh, large countries, um, or smaller countries, sorry, adopting Bitcoin as a legal tender. Um, so I, I can't see this getting any smaller. I can't see it crashing at all. Decentralized finance um, basically is a big part of cryptocurrency. It needs to be there um, because people want to earn interest on their, on, on their savings, right? It's same as a bank. Um, people don't just want to leave it in the bank. They want to do something with that money. And this is what decentralized finance allows you to do or allows them to do. So decentralized finance is not going away anytime soon. And there'll be huge competition as to who can safely, and I, I like to emphasize safely, provide um, great interest rates, uh, return on investment, et cetera. Um, so look, this, this space is only getting bigger and bigger. And if you don't, if you don't study up or get into this space or, uh, you, you're just going to be left out. Basically, I, I can't see it not being adopted into every business in the world. 
Yeah, technically, your response just uh, uh, points towards the huge debate that one could have endlessly in terms of the concept of the money, where it's all going, what's the future of finance, and the competition between between the CFI and DeFi, and and why it's all happening. So the value of money as we know it today, and 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 the shift in in the paradigm of thinking, how interesting it's going to be. Well, what would be your concluding advice, uh, the pieces of advice or tips for those entrepreneurs? who are building sort of DeFi products or protocols, or not only in DeFi or blockchain, but sort of entrepreneurs who are tech friendly, um, what kind of advice would you give them? Uh, be it from the legal standpoint or based on your work with other clientele that you have had and the ones that you're having? Yep, so, so legally, don't be anonymous. <laughs> anonymous is something that can really hurt you um, and it's very difficult to trust people that are anonymous if you're not comfortable with the project release a pilot if you're comfortable with the project and you think it's going to succeed put your face on it there's no harm um, because people want to know especially in this space if you want to re attract retail investors if you want to attract the masses they want to know there's someone behind it uh, they want to see a face etc um, I've seen a lot of anonymous projects and they've failed um, due to being anonymous. Um, so I don't see any reason behind that. And I would, me personally, I feel much more comfortable when there's a team that is not anonymous. Um, for, for going forward, definitely get legal advice. That, that's one of the biggest, I don't want to sell myself, but legal is huge. Um, if you don't have legal, and I've read hundreds of SAFs, uh, SAFT agreements, um, and they're not good, not good at all. Um, it can really kill you later down the track. Um, these things might not matter now, and you might be on a budget now, um, but you can become a billionaire, right? But all that money will be taken away just because you haven't drafted your agreement properly. You haven't spent a few thousand dollars to have your legals there. Um, even jurisdiction set up taxation, definitely get taxation advice um, because that is a big one that can hammer you. If you, if you don't consider your taxation, um, you can end up in debt. And I've seen a lot of people in 2017 um, actually get really hammered. Um, so for example, they took payment in Ethereum. They made 100,000 in Ethereum. Um, they didn't cash out because they thought it was going to keep going up. Obviously, Ethereum tanked, um, and their 100,000 was only worth about 20,000 or 10,000, but they still needed to pay their tax on 100,000. Um, so their 100,000 uh, is 20, $26,000 worth of tax, right? So now they're actually losing $16,000. They lost $16,000. Their whole year is gone. So taxation advice, I can't stress that enough. Legal advice, taxation advice, proper structuring, um, and then proper tokenomics as well, because then obviously that will crash. If your tokenomics crash, your project's not going to take off. Well, Harvard, thank you so much for this insightful, engaging, unbelievably educational conversation. This is our very first time, and definitely we will give, get him back to and, and having you for other sessions where you could educate our users, our fans and followers to learn more about the legalities. Thank you so much one more time for being the guest at Synopsis 2021. And we'll look forward to seeing you again next time. Thank you, Mia. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me on. And uh, yeah, looking to have uh, lots more fun conversations with you later down the track. So the next topic of the panel discussion is Defining NFT cultural dimensions across Nina and APAC and more. So, and the host of this panel discussion is Nastya Adamova. Let's get started. So, uh, hello everyone. And thank you so much for investing your time and joining our discussion. My name is Nastya Adamova and I'm co-CEO and CEO in Cinefy Group. Today we have an amazing panel on defining NFT cultural dimension across MENA and impact and more. Where we will be talking about the trends we need to keep our eyes on. But before we dive into the panel, 
I want to introduce our honor participant. Cecilia Wong, founder of Your PR Strategist and Managing Partner at Cinefy Group. Hello, Cecilia. Hi, Nasia. Very, very awesome to be here with you. <laughs> Faisin Kanval, NFT lead and architect at Marhaba Decentralized Finance. Hello, everyone. Thanks, Nasia, for having me here. Bilal Omarji, Sharia Scholar and Director of Sharia Experts, LCD. Hey everyone, and thank you for inviting me here. Erin Malpienis, Co-Founder, CTO at Spree. Hello, oh, thanks so much for having me. Excited to be here. We are proud to have you all here today. And uh, like, I, I want to start with some overview of what we are going to discuss. And uh, among the main topics we are going to talk about, NFT trends in uh, MENA, APA, global NFT market, regulations and ethics across different cultures and regions, uh, NFT as a tool to dive social impact, and the future of NFTs, uh, global and local perspective. So I want to start with some facts, probably very known for everyone, but still very amazing. NFT sales volume surges to 2.5 billion in 2021 first half, up from just 13.7 million in the first half of 2020. This, sound, this sounds amazing. So that's why we are here to discuss this market. And let's start with the first topic, trends of NFT market. Cecilia, while beginning your communication career in the fashion and beauty industries, your passion for decentralized technologies led you to found the, your PR strategies, boutique, blockchain, crypto, tech, PR consultancy, that is 2020 Technology Innovation Award winner in the media and PR. Would you like, Mind to start this conversation and uh, uh, share some insights about the major trends in NFT market. Um, well, I think that um, when uh, NFTs uh, started in the space, you know, with Crypto Kitties and all that, um, a lot of uh, people in the blockchain space started to get very excited. I was one of those people because um, the fact that um, these kinds of uh, tokens were non-fungible, um, that gave a very, very uh, unique, um, you know, it, it, it was, it was uh, the fact that it was non-fungible and unique <laughs> that was really um, important in certain industries. And um, um, because uh, I also have some um, music background and I know a lot of musicians and I know how the music industry has had been suffering for many years um, ever since uh, music got digitized and um, for many years nobody wanted to pay for music you know the value of music was um, literally zero because people could stream it for free they could you know just listen to it for free so no one wanted to really pay for it. And so it was a very, very uh, difficult situation for musicians. So when I heard about NFTs, the first thing that I thought about was, wow, this could be a solution for music. Um, then naturally, of course, I thought about art and, you know, I'm sure, you know, all the artists thought about how art, um, you know, and, and, and the NFT technology could change uh, what's happening right now in the art world. Um, and then for gaming, things like gaming, I think it was a very, very natural progression because um, more than any of the other industries, I think it is a natural uh, step for gaming to get into NFTs because they already understood the value of digital assets. You know, in gaming, you, you collect all these kinds of digital assets as you game to earn points, to get ahead in the game. So, I mean, these naturally, these industries naturally, I think, um, took hold in um, when NFTs um, started to uh, become um, uh, more and more popular uh, in, in the blockchain space. I think these, these industries naturally took hold um, as well as um, 
uh, I think collectibles and things like that. These are the industries that really, um, you know, like got into the space and started to um, really make a, a lot of uh, leaps and bounds, you know, in where they're going. Oh, oh I wanted to mention also that, that uh, in terms of because I came from uh, the beauty and fashion industry. Um, I, I just wanted to mention that right now they're, um, you know, like using NFTs for uh, collectibles for fan engagement in beauty pageants. Um, and I believe um, Miss Philippines, Miss Thailand right now, uh, they're actually um, engaging uh, NFT technology for uh, fan engagement of the contestants in, in the competitions for 2021, the beauty pageants. So you see NFTs really like really um, going into all areas and all industries, you know? Yeah, like I, I, I do agree with you. This is something uh, like uh, in the early beginning now, but uh, we already see the huge boost in market uh, like around us. And uh, that's why like we need to catch up with this and uh, to be aware of what about all that is happening around. Absolutely. Uh, also, we can't really talk about NFT and blockchain as a local market, as they have a global in nature, they're global in nature. So, um, but uh, like the, the mission of our like panel to try to distinguish some differences. And uh, I want to ask Erin, uh, as far as living and working in the US, you might have another like perspective. So what is trending in the US? Yeah, so the NFT space is obviously moving very quickly. It's challenging, I think, to keep up with all the different collections and drops that are happening, all the new players and platforms coming into the space because there's just so much movement that's happening, which is really exciting. Um, a few different things that at least are being talked about a bit in the circles that I'm a part of are avatars um, and different persona type profiles have been fairly popular recently, different collections where people will then, whatever NFT that they got from that drop, they'll end up making those, their profile pictures across other platforms as well. And I think that has been a point of entry for other people into the space, at least to start a conversation of oh, what, what is your picture at, at minimum to then dive in deeper into, into NFTs. Um, I think it's created an opportunity for new, maybe younger people to start making a name for themselves. Um, I don't think this is necessarily just localized to where I am, but I've seen quite a few examples all over the world as well, where younger, younger people, teenagers are able to make a decent income from different artwork that they're dropping as NFTs and have these opportunities that Maybe they wouldn't have had before just due to the different structures of the systems we have in place to kind of keep people in different circles, I guess. Um, so that's also really exciting, in my opinion, just that people now have this opportunity to step up and step in if they want to, and they're able to do so effectively. Um, I think those are a couple of general trends that that I'm seeing right now in addition to the gamification of some different platforms that just create this engaging experience as well um, to help people step into this space too. Yeah like great insights and uh, thank you for sharing and for your input Erin. Um, like as far as like I also want to cover another part of the world, Asia, and specifically China. Um, like, and in the past two months, uh, Chinese social media uh, and gaming giant Tencent has built an NFT purchase and uh, collection app. E-commerce platform Alibaba sold 50 NFT mooncakes in the stand to promote the metaverse product. 
At the same time, mining, trading, and exchanging crypto into fiat money is banned in China. <laughs> so, uh, like, maybe, like, uh, Cecilia, you paste in Singapore the most, like, uh, the most uh, nearest place here. You can tell us a bit about the Chinese approach of developing the NFT ecosystem. <laughs> <laughs> well, as um, most of us know um, in the crypto space since 2017, China has been uh, just banning. And I mean, it's like a, it's like a love hate relationship. It's like, it's like the, uh, you know, a, a boyfriend girlfriend who, who just keep breaking up <laughs> because it's like they keep banning cryptos and then and then but then they announced in 2019 that blockchain is one of like the five uh, technologies that they very um that they that they're going to place on like um i i, I don't really uh, remember the details but i remember that blockchain was one of five technologies right that they actually decided were like the, the top technologies that they were gonna focus on um, in China um, towards the development of China and all of that. So it's it's really a love-hate relationship in, in China uh, with um, crypto, blockchain, um, and anything that's uh, crypto related. And now with NFTs, um, uh, you know, in China, even without, um, you know, like, it being considered legal, uh, the NFTs have still taken on a life of their own. Um, and I believe that this is because the Chinese have found um, very creative ways to go around it. Um, I think what they, they, they tend to do is like, they, they tend to try and detach um, the whole concept of crypto uh, mm. from just uh, uh, any kind of NFT transaction and um, how they do it is um, uh, for the big tech, what they have been focusing on is um, they have been um, using what they call alliance chains. So instead of like most of the um, space, you know, we're very familiar with using Ethereum, where Ethereum's like the core chain that we're all, um, um, you know, like minting these N NFTs on. And of course there are the you know, polka dot, all that, but Ethereum is like the star, but in, not in China. In China, they, they, they try to distance themselves from it. And like I said, they have um, what they call alliance chains, which, which are really like hybrid chains, you know, like they're not really decentralized. They're like somewhat decentralized, but they're also, you know, like more centralized kinds of chains. Um, you know, just so that they, they don't have the um, association with um, Ethereum and crypto and um, all of that. Um, and then I also hear that um, there are um, other, uh, other ways they do, like using Ethereum as a side chain, you know, in the infra um, structure. So that they and then they separate all the crypto related procedures uh, from buyers and sellers um, so that people don't even feel that they are enacting a crypto um, transaction. Um, like, for example, when they um, actually um, buy the, um, the NFT, I think the artworks are priced in uh, renminbi, RMB. Uh, and then the transactions are also made with um, non-crypto payments like bank cards, Alipay, WeChat Pay. So I think these are the ways that China, um, you know, China uh, artists and, and anybody who's trying to, um, you know, like uh, be in the NFT space, you know, they try to just go around regulations in China right now. <laughs> yeah. Like they always find their own way how to do deal with this. Like totally, <laughs> they're very creative. Know, they're we very know creative. How, like how they create a separate like uh, infrastructure ecosystem of the new internet specifically for China. So I'm sure that they will do. But but like um, still. Uh, I can say that without legal access to Ethereum, uh, there is no safe way to sell uh, and uh, purchase the NFT that is done outside China. And 
may be facing, like as a former IBM developer, you have worked in many blockchain projects uh, with Ethereum and Hyperledger platforms. Do you think the Chinese attempt to steer clear of cryptocurrencies can succeed <laughs> on a technological level? <laughs> How we can separate like uh, NFT from cryptocurrencies? How, how do you see this from the uh, like development perspectives? <laughs> from the dev, uh, yeah, I'm not muted. Okay. <laughs> Uh, from the development perspective, I see blockchain as a technology and cryptocurrency and NFT are the use cases. Mm -hmm. So um, NFT, I see NFT as uh, a provenance system, you know, establishing ownership to a certain digital asset or the real asset. And cryptocurrency is, again, you know, that's uh, economic financial side of uh, making money. Um, I, I think they are different. Like if uh, what the Chinese is doing, like uh, uh, if you see NFTs, NFTs, um, since they use the same technology, blockchain technology and cryptocurrencies also use the same technology and they are built on the same platform, we tend to uh, combine them together. But I don't think they are the same thing. They are just, you know, built on the same technology. You can still transact NFTs, buy or sell them using your fiat currencies. They can later be, you know, swapped with the, the network uh, token, uh, whatever you are using. So, yes, they can be different. Like Chinese are clever and they know what uh, needs to be done. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate their, you know, uh, uh, roundabout way of uh, using NFTs. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, I, like, I know that you are um, one of the, uh, like, uh, active participants of blockchain community in Australia. And uh, uh, probably you can share uh, some things, uh, what is happening on the market now and that the, what is uh, uh, actually uh, going on, uh, like how government participate, like or not participate uh, in um, uh, promoting this um, industry and specifically NFT. Uh, Australian government is quite pro-blockchain technology. I mean, they are trying very hard to push this technology and uh, they are trying hard um, for other industries to uh, adopt this technology. And uh, they have a roadmap. In fact, I don't think many countries have a blockchain roadmap, but Australia has a blockchain roadmap. And uh, they have uh, people working towards it, like in... Um, uh, uh, for the various industries to adopt this technology, for the education sectors to uh, educate people on this technology, promoting education on blockchain technology. So, uh, and even like there are uh, many regulations that are, uh, that have come up recently that facilitates crypto payments, like, uh, you know, uh, how we pay the GST that that's been revised as uh, when you pay uh, in cryptos. So I, I see, and there are many uh, companies, many startups that are sprinting out in Australian soil and, um, uh, you know, not just NFTs, but um, using NFTs uh, as a provenance system and using it in, you know, uh, real transactions, real assets. So, yeah, I mean, uh, I'm glad that uh, <laughs> the, the, so being a blockchain developer, at least I'm glad to be here and in Australia, uh, which is so, you know, pro blockchain <laughs> country. Yeah, <laughs> this is great. And you mentioned a very interesting point uh, concerning the regulations. And this is another topic I also uh, like oh, wanted. Uh, and let, let's move to it because uh, this is uh, really amazing. 
And the regulation of the NFT industry is a very young, and the rules are, has been not defined yet. And uh, like, mm-hmm. uh, and I know that one of our participants, Bilal, uh, like earned uh, his uh, business administration in banking and law. So maybe you can start with uh, this topic and share your insights about the current situation with the regulation of NFT globally and maybe locally. Uh, well, regulation of the NFT is not really my uh, my area of expertise, but uh, one thing uh, I can talk about is the regulation of NFTs from uh, an Islamic perspective, uh, because that is going to be a very, and it is actually being a, a very important area, especially for uh, NFTs that are being developed in the MENA region or uh, in other uh, Islamic countries. And uh, at the moment, the challenge that um, the Muslim community is facing uh, around the world is whether um, uh, crypto assets uh, are actually permissible to trade or not. And you, you will probably see that in most Muslim countries, uh, they are, the, the, the current situation is that trading Bitcoin and any, any other cryptocurrency is not permissible. And that is down to uh, the uh, authorities who do not want to have a parallel system to their own uh, system. Now, when it comes to trading NFTs, there's going to be a double challenge. One challenge is, first of all, uh, whether the authority of a Muslim country is going to allow the trade of cryptocurrency as a whole and including NFTs, that's one thing. And second, uh, uh, second issue is going to be what kind of NFTs uh, will be permissible to be traded uh, in countries like the UAE, Saudi Arabia, et cetera, et cetera. Because... You see now, uh, as Cecilia has mentioned earlier, that uh, NFT uh, for music is going to be something very big and is going to have a lot of artists, etc. But then from an Islamic perspective, can, can you actually trade uh, musical NFTs? Can you actually uh, trade um, movies uh, you know, digitalized uh, form of movies or uh, even certain form of arts like drawings, etc. And in these sort of of countries? I don't think so. Reality is that that's probably not going to happen anytime soon. So now the challenge for, uh, how do you call it, for companies like Marhaba, uh, for which I am a a, a, a Sherry advisor, is how to create an NFT market that can be uh, marketable in Muslim countries. And at this moment in time, we are developing certain parameters and we are thinking that, okay, we are going to allow certain type of NFTs to be traded, but we're going to have to reject a lot of them. From a commercial perspective, that's probably not going to be very appealing. So for example, we're not going to allow uh, NFTs of... um, of uh, drawings, of uh, cartoons, for example, of uh, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, emojis, smiley faces and stuff like that. That, that is probably not going to be traded. So similarly, a lot of NFTs related to uh, gaming are not going to be traded on, most likely on the, on the Marhaba uh, um, uh, uh, NFT uh, platform. And the reason behind it is again is going back to what is actually permissible from an Islamic perspective to uh, to trade 
uh, in the first place. So like, for example, you will see that there are a lot of uh, Islamic scholars that do not allow the trade of game of gamings, for example. They do not allow the use of uh, playing, you know, PlayStation and et cetera, et cetera. Or they do not allow uh, children to watch cartoons, for example. They do not allow, you know, the usage of certain drawings or, you know, of movies and music. So in many, 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 many Muslim countries, there is the uh, issues of uh, entertainment being kind of regularized. Even if it's not regularized at a, a, at a political level, even then Muslims followers, they tend to follow, you know, the cleric, they t t tend to follow what the scholars tell them. So even like, for example, in a country like Morocco, for example, where you will see that, you know, uh, there are cinemas, there are many, you know, the uh, alcohol is, is, is kind of legal to consume in certain areas. It does not mean that all the Muslims in that country is going to, uh, for example, consume alcohol or smoke drug, etc., etc. So creating a platform that is not only in accordance with the, the, the regulation of a country and also in accordance with the regulation of uh, Islam is a very, very big challenge. And yet, uh, we, we obviously, because uh, of the, 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 this community of over a billion Muslim around the world, somebody has to take up to that challenge. And I am very glad, you know, to, to see Marhaba taking up to that, this challenge. I have also heard that there's going to be a couple of uh, new Sharia compliant NFTs that is going to be launched very soon. Uh, one, it is actually based in the UAE. But again, they also have mentioned that the challenge there is not only to create the NFT in itself, but it is to create an, an NFT that is acceptable within the Muslim community. And another issue what you will find in the Muslim community is that Islam is mainly uh, a religion which is principle-based. So you only have a certain principle, and then from these principles, the rules are made. Islam is not rule-based. We don't have a set of rules as such. And these principles, they can be interpreted in various, for, various forms, and they can, uh, depending on the area, depending on uh, the, the amount of knowledge the person has, etc., and depending on the culture. So, for example, you may have in certain countries where NFT related to music might be acceptable, but in most Muslim countries, they're probably not going to accept it. You may have in certain area where NFTs, future NFTs that is related to the photography of people, of human, of animals might be acceptable, but they might not be acceptable in other part of the Muslim world. And this is based on the various interpretation that you may have within the Islamic community. But again, for Marhaba at this stage, it's about creating a platform that is kind of inclusive of the majority of the, the Muslim followers. And then from there, you know, as the NFT markets will develop, then, you know, we can look at, you know, how to probably uh, change rules uh, according to the market, according to the demand, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you, Gilal. <laughs> uh, it, it's a, uh, I don't know that sounds. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. I, I it's could okay now. Yeah. yeah. So thank you, Bilal. It's really interesting uh, aspect. Uh, you brought up like uh, specifically the, not just the regulation, uh, but the ethical issues and uh, lots of uh, social groups uh, are not like included in the global finance system and NFT system too. And this kind of things, the like inclusion of these uh, groups are one of the um, like uh, questionable uh, topic that, that is uh, uh, need to be uh, like, uh, we need to find the solution for this. And and uh, I, I do believe that uh, uh, this is something we can see in the nearest future. Uh, but now you, what you're talking about is something like 
that is uh, probably not existing, I mean, in general, and these cultural aspects uh, and religion aspects should be uh, applied to the, uh, like, to the infrastructure uh, that is created now. Mm. Uh, I would like also to ask Faisy, because she's, she leads the development of NFT marketplace, and uh, maybe you can talk about some tools you use to protect your participants and maybe to make this inclusion real. I mean, um, like we, we all know that uh, uh, like there are so, so many uh, things that uh, like in, an, in the uh, not digital but physical world uh, are not allowed to um like uh, to to be inclu included in in, in muslims uh, uh concerning the muslim culture but what about the digital uh, marketplace uh, are there something that can improve this can uh, help to um like to make this social inclusion for example uh okay actually we will be uh, having a sharia board as the governance board but before any, because this NFT platform, it's a decentralized platform and anybody can come in and um, tokenize their artwork. But we will have a AI filter that will filter out the nudity uh, pictures and flag them. And that will later be taken up by the Sharia board who will manually inspect those artworks, those flagged artworks. And if they find it appropriate, they will be included in uh, uh, Marhaba's um, Souk NFT, that is marketplace. And uh, if they think that this artwork is inappropriate uh, as, uh, as per the guidelines, then they can you know, not include it in the marketplace. Yeah, but uh, uh, and we as as Souk NFT, we uh, because it's an inclusive platform, we are like um, targeting the calligraphy artists from any region in the world. Uh, you know, calligraphy previously it was like uh, uh, in uh, in late nineties, Britishers like in uh, people in Great Britain they tried to. Uh, uh, um, I mean, they, they, they tried to bring in the calligraphy and artist back, but, uh, but, but still it's, you know, uh, it, it, it's kind of dying art and um, mm -hmm. calligraphy is like, it can be seen as, uh, you know, the, it, um, um, it, it allows you to see each word and phrase like uh, a, an artwork tells a story. So uh, that's how we, we in uh, Marhaba Souk NFT, we are uh, uh, like um, not uh, only calligraphy, but uh, calligraphy, we are like, uh, you know, making it our main form of art in, uh, to be included in Souk NFT. Obviously, uh, 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 like all the artworks are included, but uh, the main importance will be given to calligraphic artists and to revive it. Yeah, like what I see now that uh, the uh, like uh, digital marketplace uh, has a number of tools that can help to uh, include different social groups and uh, uh, create a very safe place for them, uh, like due to the technology itself. Uh, that is uh, something that is uh, that blockchain and uh, can can help us to give us the new um, like area where uh, like people can uh, um, like be uh, a part of the global ecosystem. Yeah, th this is great. And uh, my my question also concerning the regulation will be to Erin, because I know that the U.S. market is really progressive in uh, creating uh, the uh, new laws. So maybe you can share something that is happening now uh, uh, at the market that will influence the NFT. Definitely. So. 
in the United States, there have been um, some different things put in place in relation to cryptocurrency, um, which has come out a bit more recently, maybe over the past year. Um, and then as we are looking at NFTs, there's a lot of conversation happening right now at that governmental level, but no conclusive decisions made on kind of how NFTs and some of these different digital assets will be viewed from that type of taxation standpoint in particular. Um, so I think there will be a lot more to come there in the upcoming months, but currently it's a lot of different conversations with a lot of different uh, governmental leaders on uh, opposing sides of the spectrum there. So lots of interesting conversations happening, but as it stands right now, there isn't really regulation in the NFT space um, at that, at least kind of that top-down approach for where I am. Yeah, like, sure. Like, what, what I see that, like, the biggest challenge probably will be uh, because the market is global, but the jurisdiction of, uh, uh, like, uh, go governmental, uh, uh, like, uh, tools and rules are local. So this will be something that uh, we need to figure out how, uh, how it looks like in the future. Uh, because uh, for now, this is something... Uh, uh, like uh, very uh, disputable and um, pr probably uh, probably uh, we, we have uh, to wait a little bit because the market is far beyond the uh, like uh, that government can create the infrastructure for this yeah, yeah. and not not only just in the regulations uh, for like NFTs per se, but the fact that the technology in NFT keeps on, um, you know, it keeps going. And then a lot of the NFT collectibles, they are now um, algorithmically generated. So it's like generative art. So it adds more and more complications all the time. as like another layer, another layer. So it's, I think for regulations to actually um, start to, um, take place it's really going to take a while because um the technology is like moving forward <laughs> and not stopping <laughs> so it's gonna have to keep catching up yeah like uh, i agree with you and um one of the topic uh topic i want uh, i wanted to cover also uh is about the social impact of all the things especially like we we of course uh, do understand that something is happening, but uh, how it's actually influenced our lives and um, uh, like maybe I, I'm sure that you you all have some uh, kind of initiatives or programs that uh, can be shared concerning the uh, specific uh, case studies on your markets. Uh, but uh, maybe uh, you can share something um, on our, on this topic. For example, Erin, I know that you uh, have been featured as one of the uh, 25 under 25 rising tech leaders to watch. Uh, so you probably know that the, you already mentioned the youngest generation as a social group. Do, do you like you? Do you think that something uh, can be um, helpful for the young uh, generation, uh, like with this emer uh, emerging uh, uh, technology boom in NFTs? Absolutely. I think right now there are definitely some younger Gen Z people in the NFT space, but as a whole, I think there's a huge opportunity for a major influx of more younger people to come into this space as it stands right now to, to play in the NFT marketplaces. A lot of the different collections and different items that are dropped there um, are sometimes somewhat expensive, ex especially for a younger person that hasn't necessarily yet made, made a bunch of money in life. Um, so I think as we're looking towards the future, 
the prices on some of these different items. And also as an industry, we expand to other chains that have lower gas fees and kind of just other monetary um, ties to being able to purchase or create NFTs, we'll see a lot more younger people playing here. Um, as we've, as an industry, begun to explore some of these other chains, I think there have been a lot of other use cases and conversations start to pop up in a more positive way as well, especially in relation to environmental factors. Um, as some of these other chains are a bit more environmentally friendly just as they stand at the moment. I think with the um, general trend that a lot of people younger Gen Z are really interested in social causes and things like that, blockchain as a whole gives them an opportunity to really convene and create community amongst each other and have power within that um, when otherwise they may not have that level of power, influence, or impact. And blockchain technologies as a whole really open that up for a lot of different people, whether it's across science and access to knowledge or across other social impact statements um, that people might want to make more from a movement type of perspective as as we've seen at least in the United States over the past couple of years. Um, people have things to say and NFTs really open up space to have some more of those conversations and invite other people into the conversation as well. Um, so those are a few different things I'm kind of seeing in that space right now. But I think as NFTs continue to go more mainstream, more younger people start to join this space, we'll see a lot more conversation, I guess, and across this digital medium from that social impact perspective, um, because people can have a voice through these types of technologies. Yeah, like uh, I can say that um, it's much more easy for younger people to adopt uh, such technology uh, than for uh, like uh, people who work for a long time in the traditional market and they need to change. So yeah, this is a kind of opportunity for uh, young people to create their own path and uh, uh, make something huge. So I, I do believe that's uh, the future uh, for young generation. So let's see. <laughs> um, I also want to ask Bilal. So uh, we, are, we, we have been talking a little bit uh, about the financial inclusion and social inclusion uh, of people with different religious backgrounds. So can you, maybe you can share some initiatives, some programs uh, in this specific area. Uh, I think uh, in terms of uh, um, in inclusion, uh, obviously, the way we want NFTs to be uh, structured and sold on um, platforms such as Marhaba or any other Islamic platform is that, you know, we want obviously everybody to take part in it uh, within these parameters that I mentioned earlier. And, uh, you know, we, we, anyone, we don't look at who's creating the NFT. So the, the, the issue uh, is not um, as such as who's creating the NFT. You can be anybody, you can be a Muslim, you can be a non-Muslim, you can be a man, a woman, uh, a child or an adult. Whoever is creating the NFT to sell it on an Islamic or Muslim platform, uh, they, they are just welcome. The issue is mainly in the type of content that is uh, going to be, you know, uh, allowed to be traded on these platforms. So I think that's quite uh, a statement of uh, inclusion that we are open to uh, everybody 
uh, irrespective of the gender uh, or you know age, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, as Erin has mentioned, as you mentioned as well, is that there is a huge opportunity, I think, for the younger generation, uh, especially you know in uh, po uh, poorer countries, uh, you know, in war-torn countries. I think this is an opportunity for uh, the younger generation to maybe uh, look away. Uh, from you know violence etc and uh, an opportunity for them to express themselves uh, uh, via these NFTs and to actually even make money I, I mean uh, I think this summer there was in the UK there was a 12 year old boy uh, is, who has been reported to have made nearly 400,000 uh, US dollars by selling NFTs during the holidays I mean, this is, you know, this is probably unheard of before, you know. So this is a huge opportunity for everyone, not just Muslim, but non-Muslim, Muslim and non-Muslim, and for uh, everyone around the world, you know, to create NFTs, to engage with them, to trade with them, and to have a, probably uh, a more kind of um, outlook towards art in general, uh, you know, in many, I think uh, before there are certain places, there are certain communities who probably never really connected themselves to art. And I think NFTs is that gives these people an opportunity because sometimes art is seen as something that is more reserved for the elite, is more reserved for people who can actually go out and go to a museum. Most people probably would have never been to a museum of art. I don't even remember the last time I went to to, to see uh, art in a museum. But with the NFT, is an opportunity that comes into your home, right? So the, there is this opportunity to raise awareness in terms of art in a various form and opportunity for people to actually express themselves, whether it's through art, whether it's through, you know, I think in France uh, recently, 20 minutes. So 20 minutes is uh, in France is, is um, uh, how do you call it? is a news platform which is quite famous and they have tokenized they have created an nft of an article from their archive and that's the first uh, one that has been done in france so we can see that with the nfts you can probably uh, turn into a digital form probably anything and everything and that is the opportunity uh, that is going to th this is a type of opportunity that is going to make people inclusive to take part in this sort of project. Yeah, like, uh, I uh, really uh, impressed by, by the impact that it can have on uh, our uh, society and uh, especially like creating some uh, new uh, opportunities for uh, those who are uh, have this desperate need. And um, the artist sphere uh, is always was undervalued i mean there are very few artists that can uh like uh that are paid uh, really uh, uh fair but lots of them are um uh i can say are far beyond from what they can uh t like receive on uh digital marketplaces so yeah i think this is something that uh, also uh, will change the rules here and facing i know that you are also a mature artist and love to paint uh, on your free time maybe you can uh, share and say something uh, about the traditional art and opportunities uh, that nft can open for local artists uh, previously, for an artist to show her artwork or uh, her uh, whatever, uh, you know, uh, creation, it was only through uh, advertisements or through exhibitions. I mean, it was not able to reach the global, um, the, uh, the, uh, globally, uh, globally, it was not able to, you know, uh, reach. But with um, this um, uh, platform, internet, first, let us come to internet. YouTube gave a good platform for many people who could utilize to showcase their work, but that wasn't enough. 
Why? Because it was, it could still be downloaded or stolen or can be, you know, uh, the, uh, the artist, basically the artist wasn't paid properly as per their uh, artwork. But with blockchain came the provenance and the um, ownership uh, criteria, which established the ownership of the own, I mean, uh, of the artwork and the owner. And that what, uh, you know, uh, enabled these artists to display their artwork, to reach out the, uh, you know, uh, reach out globally with their creation and display their artwork and uh, get paid, uh, uh, get paid properly, you know. So as uh, all of you said, it's a huge, huge opportunity for any artist, be, be it, uh, you know, canvas artist or a poet or a musician or a calligraphy artist, be it any artist. If that person has a talent, we can give them a platform. And uh, the blockchain gives that potential, you know, it has the potential to reach globally. So no matter where you are, where you are, you just need an internet connection. And if you have, if, if you have some of your creations, then you can mint them, you can tokenize them and sell them. <laughs> So, and I agree with you, and I can say that the, another thing that blockchain can uh, offer us, this is a trace, a traceability of everything. Traceability. Yeah, and that's exactly. uh, every uh, artist that has uh, uh, like sold something once uh, before never received any other uh, per, like royalties or, on the further uh, like uh, uh, sellers and now this is possibly because everything is transparent and the blockchain exactly. created such a great uh, tool to see uh, like uh, what is going on and uh, for artists I think this is something huge um, and this can change a lot absolutely I mean previously if I sold one of my artwork I cannot trace it, like whether it is sitting idle at somebody's home or whether that person has resold the painting for 10 times the price of the original. Uh, there, there's no way that I could know what happened to my painting or, you know, artwork. But with blockchain technology, I can actually trace where my painting is going, who has it now, who is selling it. And I can even set, uh, you know, uh, many platforms have that facility to set a royalty amount. Like whenever uh, my artwork is resold, I get a percentage of the sale, which is a huge, huge bonus for any artist. You know, th that's a type of passive income, mm -hmm. which previously never existed. Yeah. Because uh, I read it some, sorry. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Uh, no, I was just going to say that it existed uh, like in the music industries, you know, with royalty collection agencies. So they actually trace like, you know, like where tracks would go, uh, where it's used, and then they collect royalties for artists. But, um, you know, with blockchain, it's uh, one step even further. So, you know, th this is um, really a technology that is helping um, musicians, I would say, mm. um, especially with the royalty collections. Yeah. Yes. With blockchain technology, you can actually trace. You can, I mean, it, since it's auditable, you cannot hide it. But without this, it's easy to, you know, uh, tamper the data. Yeah, you, you can't play with their uh, numbers. Exactly. Everything, <laughs> everything is transparent. Great, great. Uh, this is amazing how everyone can contribute to some social good due to new technology. And I hope to see more examples of how decentralized economy can help people in the future. And talking about the future, I would, would like to wrap up our panel with a discussion about the next milestones uh, of the 
NFT market. And that can be observed in a year or so. Um, everyone is welcome to share. Uh, like maybe Cecilia, you, you can start. <laughs> <laughs> well, for me, I think that, you know, um, the kind of um, uh, uh, growth that you've seen in the NFT market um, has, has a lot to do with the hype, you know, and um, in a way, you know, I would say that I, although I love everything that's happening in the space, you know, the attention that it has brought to um, artists, um, musicians, um, you know, people who are, uh, who were at some point sidelined by their industries, you know, not getting paid um, what they're, um, you know, works were worth, you know, I, I, I was very happy that, you know, this came into the space. I would have to say that it has become a bit of a bubble <laughs> in uh, the way, you know, we see um, how a lot of, um, you know, um, hype has been taking over this industry. So for me, I foresee that at some point, you know, all bubbles have to burst. I mean, even, um, you know, like, I, I believe, you um, uh, from March to April, there was already a bit of a slump um, in um, the average price of NFTs. I, I, I thought I remember reading it was like a sixty percent slump. Um, you know, not that they're not that NFTs are going to stop in any way, but I, I think they're going to keep continuing because this, this is a technology that has utility and it is really working out for um, um, artists. But I would say that the kind of hype that we've been seeing in the space at some point might, you know, die down a little bit. Um, and the other thing that I would probably say is that we're going to be looking more towards um, um, uh, real commercial utility. Um, so I've actually come across projects where, um, um, you know, like uh, actually there's a project, Jack Coin, you know, where they have an NFT viewer. Uh, which is able to provide you like even more um, uh, information and data on uh, the different um, uh, NFTs uh, than a platform like OpenSea or uh, Rarible, Rarible or Mintable or any of the of the um, platforms right now. Um, right now, uh, I would say that uh, uh, if you're able to um, provide a, a better user interface, you know, better uh, user experience for uh, people who are transacting NFTs, that is going to be, um, that, that will be, um, I would say the uh, difference between Apple and a PC <laughs> or, <laughs> you know, I, I, I mean, if that comparison is still valid, but it used to be valid for a long time. Um, but um, yeah, I, I would say that, you know, th these are the, the um, kinds of uh, uh, um, uh, trends, I would say, or uh, I, would, I see it going this way. Yeah, if people are able to, to provide better platforms, you know, marketplaces that offer more, um, you know, uh, the user experience uh, improves for the NFT users, you know, I think this would be a, a very, very important way going forward. This is, this is a, a nice feature. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone uh, have anything to add, like share, please? <laughs> uh, I think, like Cecilia said, it's a hype, it's a bubble. Uh, then I would um, like this bubble to burst because the real potential of NFT is huge. And, mm -hmm. and I think this has not been utilized so far. And I want, technic from the technical point of view, I want the, you know, I want this potential to be utilized in various sectors. That's from me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I totally agree. I totally agree. You know, when the bubble bursts is when you actually see the real value. And this is what we saw exactly. Yeah, in, in the crypto space. When the bubble burst, you saw the projects that had real utility, real value, as opposed to the hype projects. And, absolutely, and absolutely. Totally agree, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, 
Maybe Erin Bilal, you want to add something? Sure. So I think just building off of that, I think there's this massive opportunity in Web3 and blockchain and NFTs for previously what we had seen of division across different sectors and industries, that division being broken down and can all exist within the same ecosystem using these types of technologies. So um, just kind of that intersection between gaming and art and real estate and social interactions. And I think as that merging of different spaces happens, we'll also continue to see a trend in social interactions and community really being this centralizing force within it. Um, we're already starting to see just the importance of community across some of these different collections and different DAOs that have been formed that have a bit more utility um, or other benefits connected to it. So I think as some of the structures that have been continue to break down, whether that's from a technological standpoint of view or whether that's from a more social construct perspective, um, I think we'll really see community social interaction start to rise up more and this opportunity to have a lot more exploration and connection across different people, different spaces, different um, art forms, and all of these different industries that we've never really had before um, across the world in general. Um, so I'm really excited kind of for that breakdown to then allow for this new, more connected foundation to really be that that cornerstone of of how our society functions and runs yeah i i i'm really excited about the merging actually as well the, you know the merging of the art forms like is it in the past it's like okay this is music this is um an artwork but now everything is um you know becoming very integrated which is which i think it's great i mean in terms of creativity i mean you can't ask for anything more. I mean, like that, you know, merging of all the different art forms. I, I find that actually um, one of the very uh, interesting and exciting parts of this space. Totally agree, Aaron. From a creativity point of view, I think we will see a massive growth in what we understand creativity to be, just because more people will have this opportunity to play in the space. And we're starting to just with crypto art in general, push mm -hmm. the bounds at this more um, public level of what, what art might mean and how that's valued um, across different groups. Thank you, Erin. Bilal, I saw that you also wanted something to add to summarize our panel. So final word to you. <laughs> uh, thank you. I mean, uh, I think uh, the ladies have uh, pretty much covered everything, but uh, I agree with what they have said. I think uh, that, that there has been a hype around NFTs. It is probably a bubble that will be bursting soon, but uh, NFT uh, has got a lot of commercial aspect to, to, to them. And unlike Bitcoin, probably Bitcoin has got more chance of uh, bursting and disappear eventually than the NFTs because NFTs has got much more, uh, how do you call it? There's much more potential, you know, uh, with with the th type of things that you can do, you know, uh, turning music into a form of NFT, turning videos into the form of NFTs, turning books into the form of NFT. I think, uh, was it yesterday or something? They've sold the the, the girl, it's a picture of a girl, uh, the girl into a disaster or something like that. Uh, it's a picture of a little girl and then I think there's a house burning at the back. And that picture was sold for millions of pounds. This is, this is not speculation. We're not talking about speculation uh, like we, we have been seeing uh, uh, in Bitcoin. This is actual uh, arts and wealth that people are actually after. 
So even though that the hype might die out kind of thing, uh, probably soon, NFTs are probably going to stay for a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, today we had a great chance to hear uh, like major aspects of NFT uh, from different perspectives. And I would like to thank you for all, all, thank you all for your participation um, and insights you shared. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to seeing you soon on the next event. So <laughs> I hope uh, we will have more and more things to share. Uh, in the nearest future, like the area is so dynamic, so there are always something to tell about. <laughs> so thank Thanks. you very much. Thank you so much, Nastya. It was a pleasure to Thanks, be here. Nastya. Yeah. Thank Thanks, Nastya. Thanks, Nastya. Thanks, everyone. It was a pleasure talking and listening to all of you. We help fund, build, and localize tech startups in the world's most promising regions. Cinefy is a one-stop solution for tech companies trying to make sense of China and Southeast Asia. Check out more at cinefy.group. Revenue generating methods don't allow publishers and businesses to offer an enjoyable, ad free browsing experience. We need a new solution that brings everything together to benefit businesses and users alike. That's why we made Gather. Gather is a blockchain based network that improves the online experience for users, generates additional revenue for publishers, reduces cloud computing costs for enterprises, and makes running a proof of work blockchain easier. Instead of spamming users with ads to generate revenue, Gather runs in the background of your site and with each user's consent, aggregates their idle processing power. Then it distributes said power to enterprises for cloud computing and to developers for cryptocurrency mining. Publishers receive payment in cryptocurrency or fiat, users get to enjoy an ad-free browsing experience and developers deploy their secure blockchains without the need to find new miners. Ultimately, it's a virtuous cycle that radically changes digital monetization and revenue generation to provide a superior experience for the end user. Join Gather today to be a part of the future. Imagine a lake with clear water and unpolluted air. Imagine a website with real news and no hidden, unlabeled, sponsored articles masquerading as real news. That place exists and it's called Be in Crypto, the first and only cryptocurrency news portal to provide complete transparency and honest news. Pure, relevant, informative. Are you in? build and localize tech startups in the world's most promising regions. Cinefy is a one-stop solution for tech companies trying to make sense of China and Southeast Asia. Check out more at cinefy.group. So the next topic for panel discussion is the depths, the ethical defy, and the role of women in tech. 
So the speakers are Julian Godsell and Khalid Kovlader. Welcome. Well, hello and thank you. Synopsis 2021 is more than honored to have Halit Holadar and Jillian Godso. Um, Halit Holadar is one of the shining beacons in Islamic finance with over two decades of experience. And he's the chairman of, of, of governance board of Marhaba. And Jillian Godso is the crypto advocate, keynote speaker, journalist, influencer. And she's the member of governance board at Marhaba. Thank you both for both of you for joining Synopsis 2021. We are simply excited and thrilled having you on, 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 on our panel. And I'm more than honored to be the one actually leading the conversation with you. Thanks, Thank Samisa. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, Halit, we have been in touch for almost months now. And the more I got into your expertise, the more I was fascinated. With 25 years of experience in Islamic finance, working with world-class corporations, companies, advising, um, um, developing policies, how did you move from centralized finance to DeFi? <laughs> good, good question. If you if you'd asked me five years ago when I started my own firm, I would not have remotely envisaged where I was. So, as you said, look, my background is. 20 years of traditional finance, mostly defined by 15 years at Moody's. <clears throat> and Moody's gives you a very sort of disciplined sort of mindset. Um, as you guys may know, as you know, they've nicknamed me the chief negative officer at, uh, at Marhaba because I'm always the guy that's looking for problems, looking for risks. And that kind of suits, I guess, my, my career. But then five years ago, um, when I started my own consulting firm, Accreditors, I actually um, started also angel investing. Um, you know, I look at my own personal wealth and what I was doing with my money. And frankly, I didn't think I was doing anything particularly constructive. And I thought entrepreneurship, innovation, you know, these are things that I want to support. And it's, it's, it's not been, um, I can't say it's been a very carefully planned strategy. It's mostly driven by my social network, so um, people who I trust, people who I know, and that's the first thing, you know, trust is always the, the, the hardest um, and uh, the most important thing, I think, in investing. And then if they're doing something interesting, I tend to sort of um, get involved. And I wouldn't just say I'm an investor. I'm also more of a, almost like a venture builder. I, I've heard that term because I, I try to get involved with my sort of different background, my skill set, mostly startup people are optimists, dreamers, uh, you know, aspirational, and I'm the guy who tries to bring you down to earth. And you know what, if we meet in the middle, then we're probably in a, in a good spot. And um, I've invested also in another crypto project, uh, you know, it's not yet public, but that sort of green EV electric vehicle type, you know, utility project. And that was a while ago. But um, my experience of crypto, I'm a, I'm a, I'm an expert in fiat money and debt, and I see the way the world is heading. And so, crypto for me opens up a new opportunity to have a different system. And then from that, you kind of get this evolution to crypto, crypto finance, and then DeFi. Um, which for me, uh, you know, and this is where maybe it ties into a bit themes of Islamic finance, social inequality, wealth inequality, debt, leverage, all these global problems. Um, at, at the heart of a lot of these problems, I'm not an anarchist, but sits government and uh, a political uh, agenda in whether it's Brexit or Trump or whatever, where you, know, you effectively see the social and financial system not manipulated, but favored for the benefit of the few over the many. And DeFi op offers an idealistic promise of a peer-to-peer -peer economic system where frankly, we, we can get wealthy and generate value without ever having to go to the guy in the middle who just sits there collecting, or lady in the middle, I should say, 
collecting rents from the rest of us. Um, if it's done right, if it's done well, it can genuinely be that empowering financial social system. Done badly, it's a horrendous opportunity to scam people, rob people. You can lose your money. So we've got to be really careful about consumer protection, money laundering, all these things that DeFi doesn't like, frankly. Um, so because I had that kind of agenda, when the CEO of Marhaba came knocking on my door for the third time because I'd sort of turned him down the first two because it was a bit too fringe and not re ready. Um, the third time I felt there was enough critical mass of ideas, of tech, of willingness, of intention. And I initially came on board as a sort of uh, you know, advisor, but then what they're doing, I believe, is frankly possibly world changing. So I felt it was just something I had to be more involved in. So um, both from an investment side and from an advisory side have taken on a pretty active role and very excited to be part of it. Um, so I hope that's a long way of answering your question. <laughs> it is. That's very insightful. That's very insightful. Thank you. Julian, given the advantages and disadvantages that Halat had just mentioned, you are among the 50, the most influential females in the blockchain. What is your take on Halit's opinion and how did you end up in, in blockchain because you are in industry for almost 10 years, if not more? Um, well, we kind of came the same route, although mine was a bit more painful, I think, than Khaled's. I came, I've got like 35 plus years ex uh, experience in working in fintech and in working in PR, marketing, uh, uh, and then increasingly I moved over towards journalism. And in the middle, I had a bit of a, 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 um, an interesting 10 years, shall we say, um, when I hit uh, divorce, uh, home, um, every possession, bankruptcy, bailiffs, the whole thing. The, the 2008 crash bulldozed through me in, in a major way. Um, and when that happened, um, a bit like what, what Carla was saying, I, but from a different perspective, I suddenly went, oh, hang on, because I hadn't, you don't really think about things unless you're in the middle of it. And I went, wow, there's all this income inequality. There's all this, you know, when I was growing up, I knew that we, we had this idea that, um, you know, if you worked hard enough and you got good education, you could do anywhere. You could go anywhere and you could probably do better than your parents. And then I suddenly realized when I was going through all this terrible stuff, um, it was just personally terrible. I went, whoa, that's no longer true. The world has moved again and it's no longer kids nowadays who are working hard but got an education. They, they, probably, they probably have huge college debt if they're American. So it's, it's really, really, really um, tough on kids now. The whole world is not working correctly. So I, I had my, my stint of um, activism. I wasn't an anarchist. I'm too old to be an anarchist. <laughs> so I had my stint of activism. And then um, I came across blockchain and I went, whoa, this makes sense. This is how I can help my children, but also everybody's children. And I think that's what I really like about this, this is that, um, well, I mean, I, I, I lived through the, the dot-com boom. Very interesting time, really interesting. It was interesting because there was a lot of innovation, technical innovation, some amazing stuff. I mean, think back now, when the internet first came and, and web pages, people said, oh, I wouldn't buy clothes online. I wouldn't buy a book online. I mean, like, that is so bizarre. I think we even thought those ways in the 90s. Um, and so it was innovative. They were different ways of thinking, very, very clever. Um, and what's happening in this technical revolution, which I think is, is, is interesting, is that there is a real desire to make the world a better place. So those things about income inequality, you know, fresh water, housing, remittances, all these things that are plaguing the world at the moment, there's a genuine desire for people working in the space to say, do you know what? We can do better. We can bring people into the system. We can, well, actually, or maybe you take them out of the system, I don't want to look at it, but, but we can help more people. Because what I always say, when I say about making the world a better place, they go, I'm not a hippy dippy, because, but, because there is enough food, for example. We know there's enough food to feed the world. We don't because we, there was the political will. It's not the right distribution. The whole break of reasons why it's not happening, or even the attempt of it happening, is not happening. But we could do it if if we really wanted to. And for me, blockchain is that thing, and DeFi and crypto and all. Like, it is. I'm. It, it's the scales that fell from my eyes, and I went, "Whoa, this is liberating. It's empowering. It gives women." Women, women extra choices um, and you said I'm, I mean I, I'm very passionate in the space so I do end up on lists um, where I'm with the women other, and other people too as well but I, I love the fact that women can, can be empowered 
and the disenfranchised can be empowered. So that's where I'm coming from. I just love the space. And I, it's not all plain sailing. And actually, Kelly kind of made the, the comment that there are scams and it's new and it's a bit wild westy. So it's not, you know, an innocent place per se, but it's an exciting place and has the potential to do amazing things. Well, as a, as a, as a being among the 50 the most influential females in blockchain, there are a lot of projects that reach out to you, but at the end of the day, you decided to become a member of governance board at Marhaba. What was that journey like and why did you decide to, to join the project? Well, I have to say the CEO is an amazing man and I have such admiration for him. He's just a patient. <sighs> I really like him. And again, it goes back to what, what Khalid was saying, that it's trust, it's people that you like. So I've known him for a long time. I know when the project took off and I wasn't able to join initially. Um, but the project, what I didn't realize, this is something, again, you know, not you don't know these things until you go through that. I was advocating for women and for the disenfranchised to be able to access blockchain and the various tools and um, money, whatever, whatever, you know, access to credit, all the different things that it can offer. And I didn't realize, and unlike, I had no idea about Islamic finance at all, at all, at all. So I didn't realize that um, people were, Muslims were living a life that they had to, they didn't feel comfortable using traditional or Western finance, and they wanted to do, use finance that, that suited them. And I went, whoa, another billion, billion people who were outside the circle of crypto. And I, I had no, I mean, I'm learning all the time. I had no idea that that was the case. And I thought, whoa, there needs to be something because that's a million people who, who can't benefit from what I think is the most amazing, democratizing, uh, uh, fantastic technology um, and, 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 and potential to earn, to earn money, it's to just, it's just it's potential because how do ordinary people act, get access to credit? How do ordinary people who are maybe on the breadline or who don't, just how do ordinary people just go up in the world nowadays? You can't in the traditional world, I say it's very broken. So anyway, that's, I went, yeah, okay. And, and another billion people to sort out, I'm in. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Jillian, thank you so much. Halet, probably you are the best person, not probably for sure you are the best person to educate our audience. What are the differences, the major differences between the Islamic finance versus the traditional finance and why it matters? Sure. Well, look, firstly, um, uh, uh, I'm always happy to announce that, um, you know, well, firstly, the main principle is that of debt and lending. And the idea that you shouldn't make money out of other people's indebtedness. And also from my time at Moody's, where I was at the ringside seat of the financial crisis, the financial crisis was probably one of the first where morality, ethics, greed really came to the fore. And I, I saw firsthand what happens when you have misaligned incentive structures. So I get rich when you get poor, you know, you bear the losses, I bear, the, I keep the winnings. This type of mentality, this winner sort of take all. And um, when it comes to debt, um, especially personal debt, there's no, there's no in it together type thinking. I'm actually, as the person with the money, I'm incentivized to load you up with as much debt as possible to your breaking point. So I actually kind of get richer from interest sort of based income while you get effectively get poorer. Now, ordinarily, if people are educated and are well versed in personal finance, which most people are not, I actually think it's a crime that you might learn geography, history, French at school, but you don't learn about personal finance. It's unbelievable. It's the number one thing, in my view, that destroys families, that destroys people's livelihoods depression, there's so many consequences of indebtedness, suicide, etc. So when you have an interest debt based system, it just I just fundamentally misaligns you. And those with money just want to load up people. And what we've done in the West, we've created a consumption driven system where for economic growth and supposed shared prosperity, we convince people to buy things they don't need with money they don't have. And if ever you stopped buying that plasma TV or the next iPhone or the next car, the whole system would grind to a halt because all the people working, building plasma TVs and building 
extra cars would have wouldn't have jobs so we've built this pyramid of debt-based consumption that is unsustainable and a lot of that is driven by the fact that as banks we create money from nothing whatsoever we lend it and we make profit having actually done very little work whatsoever so it actually goes back to almost fundamental um ethics society even sustainability there's a huge thing now about sustainability and you know safe planet and conserving um i had a, an epiphany about a, six months ago if when with all this money printing going on if you have an infinite supply of money that means infinite consumption you actually cannot have a sustainable planet when you just create infinite money because the money has no cost before and this is a bit anachronistic when money was backed by gold there was actually a limit to how much money you could create you needed something physical and valuable but now we broke from that in the 70s um you know richard nixon following the vietnam war and running the country into debt figured i can't afford this let me just break the gold standard and now we've got all the governments in the world have, have now got this free pot of money where they can just keep printing and destroying um, uh, the system. So going back, uh, sorry, a long way back to your question, if you do, if, if economic activity, um, debt in Islam has to be backed by something, you can't raise unsecured debt. So you can fund, raise debt to build a business or to buy a house or buy a car but it's always got to be against something physical. I won't fund you just to go out and spend money on consumption. So it's a natural break on economic activity. Some will say, oh, it means you grow slower, but it just means you grow in a more stable way. So when you have that prohibition of interest, and, and my original point was actually the, the Muslims didn't invent this. Um, uh, the Christians, uh, the Jews, and even before them, the Greeks, had this and I, and I kind of believe that 2000 years of 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 learning or thought went into that and then we kind of threw it all in the bin in the name of banking consumerism and debt and lending and look where we are today global debt to gdp is i think 360 percent that money is never ever going to get paid back we can either default or what the governments are doing printing money and what's happening is asset prices are going up so the rich are getting richer. And if, you, if middle and low incomes tend to have more money in cash. And so this trend of inequality is being massively exaggerated like never before. So in a system as Marhaba, where we don't engage in any interest-based lending, it's about trading, investment, a global financial system or a complementary system, which doesn't involve debt and lending, um, is one that I think works. And, and satisfies a lot of concerns that Gillian has raised. Now, it's not just about interest, just to quickly mention ethics, um, you know, uh, fairness, social justice, you know, um, uh, uh, arms dealing, pornography, drugs, you know, all those things of thou shall not, you know, they're all there as well. And, but people say, oh, those are anachronistic. Those are morals, religion. They don't have any space in today's modern society, but I think our modern society is a failure of ethics and a failure of social justice. And maybe religion as kind of, you know, quirky and as old as it sounds, maybe has something to teach us about a more ethical way. And that's kind of the hope. And technology, combining the latest in technology with ethics, I think probably gets us to that place, that sort of utopian ideal at least the first steps of that that we're hoping to go but we're still a long way from that so you know watch this space well thank you for that very insightful answer but i had one clarifying question during our earlier discussions you mentioned several times that islamic finance amounts for three trillion dollars and when it comes to DeFi, it's zero and DeFi, by definition primarily most of the projects that i have seen um interest based now we're talking about marahaba the, the first ethical, inclusive, sharing compliant project. How Marhaba is going to bring this novelty um, in Islamic finance of $3 trillion, and, and at least excess 1% of $3 trillion. 
So look, the three trillion number is interesting because usually if you're building a business, you speculate as to what is the market, what's the potential. Um, luckily with Marhaba, there are so many strong metrics around Sharia sensitive banking and Sharia sensitive investment that we actually have a number. There's three trillion dollars where people have chosen to bank Islamically because of faith, ethics, value, etc. So that's our number. Um, now, a lot of those, a lot of that three trillion is actually replicating interest mechanisms. So it's not quite the ideal, but at least the intention of parties is there. Now, when you get to DeFi, of course, lending and credit and yield farming is probably one of the highest sources of returns. And I actually think we're just importing the problems of the existing financial system into DeFi. We just, without consumer protection, people end up taking massive crypto loans, they'll be indebted, they'll lose, you know, there's not, there's, as, as, as Gillian said, it's a wild west, it's not a safe place for the average person. Now, but there are other ways for protocols to make money. Uh, trading, staking are two very simple ones. Islam uh, encourages that financing, you be rewarded for creating some kind of tangible value or economic activity. So pure unsecured lending is, is non-compliant, but funding a business, taking a share of the profits is compliant. So for example, for me, if, um, you know, if I was in charge of uh, Amazon, every employee should have equity. Jeff Bezos doesn't need to be worth 50 billion. You know what? He could let, leave him 20 billion just for himself. The other 30 billion should be accruing to the people who work on the factory floor. Now imagine you had an economic system where people were sharing in the wealth. Suddenly Amazon single-handedly would have taken 200,000 people above the poverty line. So, but we've, we're in this system where profits are not shared. So in DeFi, if you're making profits through trading, providing liquidity pools for halal tokens to be exchanged, et cetera, you're providing a service. You're acting like a currency exchange in a way by providing this you know, um, buying and selling service and you're entitled to a share, a percentage of that volume. So that's one source of halal returns. And there's so much fragmentation in DeFi, so much fragmentation in crypto that actually lots of liquidity pools you know, providing uh, currency or you know, cryptocurrency exchange is actually a valuable service. Then you get to staking and people said, oh, but isn't that lending and so on. But um, if you think about each chain as a, as a network that needs maintenance, that rather than having paying a million IT guys to be on the payroll, you actually reward independent people to be your validators on the network, to confirm transactions, to validate transactions. They're providing an economic service, maintenance, servicing, tech, whatever you want to call it, but they're doing something. They're not just borrowing money and lending and they're getting rewarded in, in coins. So staking is for me uh, and our Sharia board is a form of economic activity and you're entitled to be rewarded for that. So it does narrow the field for sure. Marhaba cannot make money the same way as every other platform. And that probably means we might not make as much money, but the money we make, we believe is in a more ethical halal way. And even our initial products, we're not even going to try and offer the risky products, the altcoin products into our community. We'll go for stablecoin products because we don't want retail to lose money. But even if you're making in crypto low returns of five to 15, these are extraordinary compared to what people are making from their banks, which is zero. So if we can offer a relatively low risk crypto product, giving people five, 10% return in a safe way, in a protected way, then even the average person is entitled to earn some decent return on their savings rather than watching it get destroyed by inflation through money printing. Um, so again, I probably answered your question in a really long way. <laughs> but I, I, keep, I keep going off of these random tangents. But two, uh, two, 
if, if I can jump in, two things jumped out of me when you were speaking there. I, I, well, three things actually, reward and sharing. I'm going, that sounds very nice to me um, because I also don't believe in like, for me to win, you for you to lose. That, that doesn't make any sense to my head whatsoever. What I love to as well, you mentioned Jeff Bezos and then Amazon in a recent interview, someone said that to him, would you not give you know a billion away to your employees? And he went, why should I? <sighs> Alarm bells. And then you compare that with, you probably heard come across Dan Price. He runs a payment, I think it's called Gravity Payments. He's uh, Seattle, I think. And a number of years ago, he decided to take a million dollar pay cut for himself to ensure that everybody in his company was paid 70 grand minimum. That was their minimum uh, wage. And, and, and people at the time, they called him a communist and socialist, you know, all these misuse of terms. And they said, oh, it'll all go to bust. What's happened? His company really successful. Productivity has gone through the roof. And why not? They've also had loads of babies because people can afford to buy their houses. But he's got a committed workforce. And, and that, that is, and he, the, I just think this man is amazing. He's come up with so many different things. I'm going, yeah, and, he, and then actually in, in turn, I think actually the staff all got together and bought him a Tesla as a thanks because they could, because they had extra money. And I think his salary has gone up again, but it's not, you know, in the, in the old world, the CEO earns multiples of the secretary, of the cleaner, of the person down the line and pays a tiny amount of tax. You know, that, that, that just doesn't make sense. And it's not, I'm not saying against people being successful. Everybody wants to be successful. That's a real given thing you want to do. But again, I don't want to be successful at somebody else's expense. That to me is, is what, what I love about this industry. And I love the way that, that Khaled explains about the finance, how it's done in Marhaba. I'm going, this is something that I really, really like. Well, Jillian, uh, during your career, you have met hundreds of people. Um, some of them um, good friends. You interviewed some of the influential people. And there are those people that remain based on their activities or legacy. What are the people or who are those people that had that enormous social impact within the space, be it the crypto or deep or blockchain, that you think are worthy of, of spreading the word about? Well, one man, one of the first people that I came across in this industry, uh, Dan Top Tapscott, with his uh, son, he wrote the book, I think it's Blockchain for Beginners or whatever, but he did a yeah. TED Talk back in 2008, I think, where he explained why this technology was so important. And when you first come into this industry, it is a bit confusing. I mean, like we're all used to the terms now and it makes sense and decentralization and DeFi. And we kind of know all this stuff, but at first it does seem a bit counterintuitive. It doesn't seem right. His TED talk is amazing. And actually I interviewed him recently and he was saying, because of now the interest in crypto again, it's growing, it's like 3000 views every day. It's, it's going up and up and up. So he's an amazing man. I love um, Alex Mashinsky in Celsius. He's obviously a serial US entrepreneur who put the Wi-Fi in the uh, subway. Um, and he is, he's, he's running Celsius, which is another banking organization. The idea that it's making it accessible for everybody. Um, who else? I actually interviewed the late John McAfee. And I know he's a, a very large character, I think is the best way to describe where he was. But we spoke about poetry. And I just, he's a larger than life character. And he's a lot of very funny things that I'm not. But... An interesting man, because sometimes you need giants, even like kind of unusual ones to eh, just talk about things. And I am sorry it was passing. Um, and who else? Liberland. It's a micro nation between Croatia and Serbia. And I know the president very well there. And I love the fact of a new country. It's a micro nation born without bloodshed. How nice is that? There were no wars. There's just they're, they're there. I haven't quite got the UN um, recognition. But that's a really interesting project, too, as well. Rethinking how you do stuff and using blockchain to provide the governance for the, for the country, how, how it's run. Um, and loads of interesting. Bridget Greenwood is a woman based out of the UK who set up the bigger pie. Uh, and she's a woman very much after my own heart because she's there to help promote women because there aren't enough women in the space. Um, there's only like 8% women in the space and we do need more. And, and a, an amazing, affirmative, uh, very quiet, modest woman in many ways. She's very intelligent, but she is a great support to, and it's not just UK women, obviously I'm Irish, but a lot of uh, uh, other nationalities so th there's so many I don't I don't know <laughs> I don't know where, and what I love too as well I'm very lucky because I'm a journalist in the space and because it's such a nascent industry I get to interview all these big names I mean if I was trying to interview you know the head of IBM whatever or uh, uh, Coca-Cola whatever I wouldn't get near them 
You know, I have to be, I have to be the senior editor of the FT to get near all these top names. And because it's such a new industry, I have the privilege, the absolute privilege to talk to people who are at the top of their game and doing amazing things. And, and it's not always just the big exciting ones. You meet young people who are just passionate. They've got, a, I met this young chap recently, um, Jonathan, and I can't remember, but it's, it's his company, Suco, and it's basically supply chain. So it's using blockchain to do supply chain. But what I love about what he's doing is that he goes back, obviously conscious consumers want to know where this product is coming from. His emphasis is on the farmers at the far end, and a farmer could might only have a few acres. Um, and he does two things. One, he, allow, he rewards them in tokens for providing the data so that us folk at the top end of the, of the chain can be feel happy about. But also he does things um, where he gives them uh, access to uh, microloans. I remember talking at the time and he said, Julie said that when you hear microloan, and maybe it's, it's 50 euros or whatever, he said, in actual fact, he said, that is a loan. That farmer, somebody said, that might be 50 euros or $50, might be enough to buy the seed for her small holding or the, you know, to buy so livestock. And that puts a whole new context on things when you go, whoa, it's that that's important. So I am very privileged to, and I love what I do. I love it. I love meeting people and in, interviewing people and um, big, small. This they're, they're just so passionate in the space. It's just uh, I'm very privileged. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, Jovan, if you were the one to start a project yourself in DeFi or in crypto or in blockchain, um, what project would you start and why would that matter? Unless you had already started or unless you were thinking about it. There is one that I, and I, um, I've interviewed people who've got different ideas and, and none of them have sort of carried through. But when I, I mentioned that I had went through the banks taking my home and coming bankrupt and all the rest of it, and I was never actually homeless. Now I was lost my home, but I was never actually out on the street. Myself, my two kids always had roofs over our heads and we, we supported family and friends. So I was never actually out on the street. And I know for a period I was singing with the Island of Ireland Peace Choir and they were very much active with the Hope, the Hope Choir, is that right? Hope Choir, um, where people who were homeless came out and were singing. And then I met people who sang with them, people who had actually spent years on the streets and the devastation that it put on them. So I would love a project because I get, I, I volunteer at quite a few charities. I'm on a board of a charity here in Ireland too as well, a volunteer uh, for, uh, on the board. But sometimes I think there's so many charities involved with homelessness. I don't know, they seem to suck out a lot of money. There's more money spent on people working in homeless than there is on the people. In the, and I, I would, and I don't know, I, I've, I've spoken to people with, with sort of ideas, but how do you take out the middlemen? Do you know what I mean? The well, very well-meaning people working in homeless and just help the people directly so if i if i come across something like that i'm in another one i'm in uh, because i think it just there has to be a better way of doing it because i know jesus would have said the prayer are always amongst us but there has to be a better way of finding helping the homeless without all these middle charities you know okay that, yeah i mean just that, to as just to add on that i mean i i think the whole um aid sector mm -hmm. it, there's so much um uh inefficiency at the best case or corruption at the worst case I, I remember one project where we were doing sort of humanitarian ready to eat meals and one of our sponsors had produced a whole bunch and said okay let's just give them away and we went I think it was to a UN agency said look we've got a million a hundred thousand meals can you just give them away for free and they're well well no we can't um we need to charge you 30 percent of the value of the food so that we can give it away for free. And it's like, well, hold on, you know, so all this infrastructure. So, so you know, if, if you set the price of the food really low, and then, well, no, it's too low for us, then we're not going to do it. So th there's an entire bureaucracy and infrastructure around procurement. And, and I think aid would probably be a, an, an amazing use case for blockchain, value transfer, accountability, governance yeah. uh, around it. Because it, it doesn't, if you, if you attract the altruists, you know, the, the, the do-gooders are probably actually not the best at necessarily running a business because you need to think a bit like a business person. And if you're a business person, you're probably missing the altruism gene. And and so, you know, there isn't always a nice confluence between the two disciplines. But maybe, yeah, I think that could be a good uh, use case yeah. for, for, for tech. I think so, because you're right. Because, I mean, a, a lot of charities, they, as you say, they... they 
there's a, there's a lot of um, extra weight in there and that there's a lot of bureaucracy and it's 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 quite scary to think about how much money goes into the charity and then how much actually goes down to the people that need it you know and, and I know you can't just give money out per se or maybe you can I don't know but maybe there must be a better way of thinking about this of fixing the problem and I, I don't I'm not smart enough to know what it is but if someone comes and tells me I'd be very happy to help I mean I think yeah just a quick because you know there's a I saw this clip this one you know you know LinkedIn these video clips come up and they sort of gave like uh I know a, a hundred homeless people they just gave them some money to see what they would do with it and they didn't and obviously there was some selection bias they didn't have mental problems or addictions etc but just genuinely sort of homeless people and then they came back to them in a month and they found that they'd sort of cleaned themselves up you know uh living in a in a small apartment so a lot of them just need that sort of boost to get back into the system as opposed to sort of incremental handouts. So your theory about, you know, as long as people are reasonably mentally, you know, well balanced or in a good place, most people, if you if you give them money in that situation, they're not going to squander it. They yes. know better than the rest of us how precious it is. And so do you need this massive bureaucracy to, you know, for every dollar? only 30 cents gets gets to the person on the street i don't know maybe blockchain maybe yeah. there is a different way somehow yeah i'd like to think so because i think blockchain is so transformational in many ways i'm thinking here's a real problem um, maybe someone watching this will, will write into us afterwards yeah. and say, here's a project yeah yeah well i'll just to, to follow up on that 30% example, which kind of is kind of interesting. You talk to this IMF people, World Economic Forum people, all those regulators, yeah. you have been in touch with them for almost two decades. What is the response um, of the cameras in when it comes to cryptocurrency, DeFi? Probably there are two groups of people, the old school, those who are sort of against, and there are just the millennial ones that are sort of embracing the new technology. So look, uh, I have to qualify my, my, my response to speculation because my days of hobnobbing with the IMF and the World Bank and IIF um, was more my institutional days where because of Moody's, I was the head of Middle East banks. You know, I was a, I was a true old school sort of CFI type person and, and, and that's that. But, um, but it does give me a bit of a sense as to how they think and, and what their concerns are. And I think... Um, there's a, obviously it's not a simple, it's not a simple agenda, but um, on the one hand, there is a genuine concern about self-interest, money laundering, corruption, and so on. But my personal view is that it's, it's a bit of a, a boogeyman or a red herring, because if you want to do an audit trail of a crypto coin, you can do it much better than the US dollar. So the, the technology itself is absolutely in favor of anti-money laundering KYC. The providence of that coin, you know, if the parties were willing, you could trace it all the way back to white coins or black coins, white coins being they've originated somewhere where you can track the providence and you know that it's been done in a, for lack of a better word, a halal way. And the others, you just join them in a gray area. And, and, I, and I can see um, quite often, they seem to be throwing out the baby with the bathwater. And that's where my sort of more cynical Machiavellian hidden agenda comes into play, where, um, you know, beyond um, the military, the most effective means of power is money. And um, central banking, I, I only learned this not, you know, a few months ago or six a year ago it's a marxist concept you know everywhere else we believe the private sector is a much better allocator of resources and value um but for some reason we've absolved the fact that actually money is best left in the hands of politicians or supposedly independent central banks who have done a spectacular job of managing it for their own interests with, with and you can see with all the debt and i think the breaking of gold standard or tangibility has, has broken that governance mechanism. And now they're there in the sweet shop and then, they, you know, they've got unlimited access. So um, the cynic in me says that the incumbent regulatory powers who 
manage fiat currencies as a form of, um, in some ways, rightly balanced economic activity, wrongly in terms of abusing monetary power for political gain, which is what we see time and time again. Right now, we don't we don't believe voters voters don't respond to prudence. Voters don't respond to managing your 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 your, your debts. Voters love it if you can spend money on everything and worry about the bill later. So it's our kids that will end up paying all these taxes. The population is aging, pension entitlements are unfunded. You know, you want free healthcare, free education, free, 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 which is great, but it just means that other people have to pay for it. And, um, you know, there's a nice quote, governments are excellent at spending other people's money. Um, so, uh, you know, that going to your question around these institutional actors that have been around for so long and are so intermeshed with the existing system, you can't honestly ask them to be objective about a system that they depend on for power. Um, if you had a private sector currency like Bitcoin, and I take the analogy of um, Napster. I don't know if you remember mm. Napster, right? Streaming. They created a much, you know, this guy created a much more efficient music delivery system than the billions of dollars of record companies or, or you know, recording companies ever did. And, um, uh, and because they refused to innovate, they refused to, you know, service the consumer in a way that was um, favored them. They favored themselves over the consumer. An innovator comes along and shows that actually you can deliver value and so on. And guess what? Music is now streamed everywhere because they had to compete with a private sector innovative solution. Now, for me, the value of cryptocurrency to these big ossified institutions, if you don't get your house in order about how you manage money, about how you manage the economy, well, I've got this private sector alternative that says you're printing US dollars and you're destroying my wealth. Bitcoin is not, it's preserving my wealth. So you need to run your house as good as Bitcoin or some other private sector mechanism. And then, then I'll choose your currency. But the governments won't do that because then you, they lose a, a source of power. And so they have to come out and slam cryptocurrency and all, you know, with this boogeyman of AML and all the rest of it. It's very disingenuous. And, um, you know, we have to see how it plays out because at least in the US, even though they're abusing the printing presses, they still have the concept of liberal freedom and private sector and the private sector is, you know, the consumer still is powerful. Go to the other side of the world with our number one fan of crypto, which happens to be where you are, banning it left, right and center because their central bank coin means that I can track every single person, what they're spending, what they're doing in. It's the ultimate form of control. Now, you'll never have that Orwellian 1984 approach in the US, but they both have similar agendas, but the US cannot come out and say it, whereas China just comes out and does it. So that's why I don't think you'll have any fans, uh, frankly, amongst the institution which is why, sorry, the, sorry to go on, but the last thing about institutional DeFi, the moment you have institutions starting to make money in this space, then actually this cryptoverse becomes part of the acceptable system. And then it becomes much harder to break because if JP Morgan and HSBC and the central bank of XYZ are in this space, well then, you can't just throw it out. You can't just say it's for criminals. And so I do believe institutional DeFi holds a bit of a promise for um, a collaborative, complementary approach between the cryptoverse and the old world. Um, but I don't expect the old world to go down without a fight. Um, so let's just see. We're at the very earliest stages. It's a very exciting time to be. Um, but there's a lot of entrenched powers that stand to lose under a new system that's kind of an interesting historic background along with the potential potentially what could happen in the future 
Jillian, um, the industry is aggressively run by males, mm -hmm. and you're the advocate of females. Um, how does the participation of females could improve the situation? And what would be the long lasting social impact in emerging markets, especially in this case, Marhaba is, is um, addressing its solution to exclude it over a billion um, potential users. What would be your take on that? I'm so glad you asked me that question. <laughs> Smiling away here. Um, two things I wanna say, I, I often give talks and I start with a joke and I say, if the Lehman brothers had been the Lehman sisters, we might not have had the crash in 2008. And then I had another re revelation that recently, I was thinking about this fable. And this, and this kind of speaks to why you need women in, and diversity, it's not just women, so you need different people. Uh, but women being half the population need to be in the decision-making processes here. But um, you know the old fable of the, well, there's six or so wise men, but who were blind in a village and they'd never seen an elephant. So I took a young boy, took him out to meet this elephant. These are six wise, but blind men. And the first one feels the trunk and he says, oh, it's like a, a hose. And the other guy feels the side and said, oh, it's like a wall. And someone felt the legs like a tree trunk. And then it was like a rope and it was like a spear. And, and this has shown, it's a very well-known fable, right? And I mean, and I only recently thought about it and, I, and, and it's, it's supposed to show about perspective, which it does very ably. But also I thought if that had been six wise women, they had chatting to each other and they would have said, guys, it's not a, a snake and it's not a rope and it's not a, it's an elephant. And this is what it looks like. So I think what women can do is, and I am being stereotypical here, so I apologize, but we're more collaborative, I think. And it's, and it's less the softness or the empty, you know, all the different things go on because I, I also encourage more men to get into nursing or caring jobs because that's also very important. But I think bringing women in, well, we also know, sorry, too, as well, that um, McKinsey, Credit Suisse and Nordia all did big studies on putting women in, in positions of power and I think in, in decision-making roles in uh, publicly quoted companies and to a company, their profits went up like between 20 and 30%. And it's just, it, it's, it's, it's the whole diversity thing. Because if you have all people who think the same way, act the same way, went to the same schools, they're going to think the same way and, and not innovate. It's very hard to innovate if you're all going, oh yeah, yes, that's right. We like this and we, whatever. You bring people who are different and new and of different perspectives on life and it's it's just interesting so so I, I i think this industry is so it's so important and it's way too important to be left to men alone i, I just it's i don't know it's, it's all this new thinking and i really want women involved because it also the other thing too is what you said in disadvantaged areas if people don't have access to you know you you've heard this too as well if you invest in a woman say maybe especially in a rural um you know, uh, uh, place in a, an emerging country. If you invest in the women, you educate the women, uh, the, the it, women raise up the whole village, the whole community, because they, they put it back into their children and then the children. So the whole community rises up. And it's not that men don't look after their, their children, but it's that, again, studies have proven that you educate the women, you educate the whole village because the children then become educated. So it's the same way that it's, it's kind of an, an a no brainer. I mean, we're, ha I think actually there's, we're 51% women, I think on this island, on this world, but uh, it's just, it's a no brainer. It, it makes things better. And, uh, but I, 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 I start off with women, but I also mean diversity. So we're, we're so much better now in this world where, you know, with LGBTQ people, with disabilities, with, um, you know, different, uh, anything, religions, anything where we're becoming, well, some parts of the world we're not, but, it, but it, I think we're becoming more educated to understand that diversity is an amazing wonderful thing and while it's lovely to be like i'm very proud to be irish I'm very proud to be irish but i also love that you know we've lots of new nationalities coming in here and it makes for a more interesting world and you just you learn stuff this is like wow so anyway that's my thing it's, it's too important to be wasted on men alone to be shared well, julian i mean look not to um endorse your stereotype but i had a long career in financial services but i actually had the good fortune of actually having quite a few um, yeah, female managing directors, um, long career as well as males. And um, I actually preferred in this um, because I found, again, massive stereotypes, just a mm. you know, very small selection bias. I find they were much more interested in consensus yeah. versus ego, um, much more in, you know, inclined to listen to other opinions. I found even them also sometimes more ethical in terms of their career ambitions. 
So whereas um, I tended to find, um, you know, some of the males more politically oriented as, you know, financial services can be quite a, you know, uh, um, a charged place. Whereas, you know, not to say that they weren't career oriented, but they didn't feel like they had to get it by stepping on top of other people. Now, obviously, there are exceptions to the rule. And I'm sure, you know, Margaret Thatcher is, is probably a, a nice example. But um, in my experience, uh, it, it's definitely been a positive, the, the female managing directors that I've worked with. Mm. I would agree. And it's not, I mean, I've enjoyed working for men and for women too, as well. I, I see different sides, but it just makes sense. You know, we're, we're, we are a world and um, it just, it, we, yin and yang, you know, and, and yeah, it just, it's more jolly, I think. And it's, yeah. And I've, I've nothing against like single sex education or any of the other things that happen or clubs. People want to do whatever they want to do. It's live and let live. But I do think when it comes to ruling the world that we need to be all up there at the table. Yeah, my favorite politician is Jacinda Ardern. Oh, do you know what I love about her? And I'll jump across too. She said, and you, you mentioned earlier, I'm going to come back to you. She was talking about growth and you were talking about, you know, endless growth. That's not possible. And she said the same too. Why does everybody judge a country on its GDP? She said, why not? Is there not a happiness quotient? Is there not a well-being, you know, a fitness, uh, you know, so it's not, GDP is not the only way to judge the success of a country. And this is like about mm, six, seven years ago. I went, wow. Yeah. She's some woman. Well, if you um, bring Khaled with you and then Jillian could give a concluding um, sort of idea or statement or by, by just sort of covering, so there's the blockchain part of it, there's the social impact part of it, there's the equality part of it. Um, what would be a um, concluding idea that you want our audience to go away with? So look, um, the existing financial system, I think the first interest lending bank started in Italy somewhere, maybe like 500 years ago. Um, and I, you know, as someone who um, isn't a particularly optimistic person, you know, um, about the world, about the situation, because I'm, I'm too neck deep in some of the problems. Like I had a ringside seat at the last crisis. Um, I genuinely feel that through the use of blockchain, decentralized finance, um, done in the right way, in a way that protects consumers, in a way that doesn't allow for money laundering, et cetera. For the first time in 500 years, you know, we can have a, a better peer-to-peer -peer financial and economic system that can liberate low-income communities, middle-income communities, share the wealth. You know, the idea of having a centralized entity that controls everything in the country it goes completely against capitalism you know community you know a community in you know the, the 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 tail end of cornwall has nothing in common necessarily with a community at the northern end of scotland for example and that's just in one country imagine the eu with the ecb it's a complete disaster to tie everybody into the same same straight jacket now fine have that straight jacket but if you've got peer-to-peer DeFi running at micro communities and macro communities, you can let the rest of the world carry on on the macro level, but DeFi can empower people really at that bottom level. And um, yeah, I, the last the thing I want to convey, I think we are at a potentially transformative part in history, um, even more powerful than the internet was, to be honest. You know, the blockchain can be a transfer of value an economic value mechanism transfer, not just data. And that will be a liberalization factor for everyone if we get it right. Wow, I endorse everything you're saying and you say it very uh, articulately and eloquently. The thing that I normally say, uh, Amir, when I'm my sort of give sort of takeaway message whatever to people, because there's still so much FUD around the place and people and, and sort of scammy, not scammy, sorry, but sort of uh, scaremongering that it's all a Ponzi scheme and it's full of criminals and all the rest of it. What I like to say to people is, look at me. I'm a middle-aged, middle-class lady. Nothing scary about me. And I love this, this industry, you know what I mean? So it's, I'm not an anarchist and I'm not, I'm, I don't know, I'm, I'm very boring, but I love it. So I, I like to give people the, the, the permission to come on in too as well, because if someone like me can like it, well then it can't be all bad. Well, thank you so much for sharing with your, with your wisdom, Jillian and Hala. Um, I, I hope 
on behalf of Synopsis 2021, this is the inception of, of your future presence and participation on the panel and probably keynotes. Thank you once again for your time. And we truly hope that our audience will benefit from the ideas and insight you have shared. Thanks a lot. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Cheers, Emerson. We help fund, build, and localize tech startups in the world's most promising regions. Cinefy is a one-stop solution for tech companies trying to make sense of China and Southeast Asia. Check out more at cinefy.group.
We help fund, build, and localize tech startups in the world's most promising regions. Cinefy is a one-stop solution for tech companies trying to make sense of China and Southeast Asia. Check out more at cinefy.group. So now there will be a panel discussion on the topic of faith, Islamic ethical defy, an empowering force for excluded communities. And the Amir San Roberta will hold the discussion. Welcome. Well, I'm going to start then. Well, hello. <coughs> Very nice to meet Marhaba team. Today we have higher ups from the team that are excited about the project. We at Cinefy are very excited, both as the partners and joining the forces with the team. And today we would like to explore the idea of Marhaba, how it came to its fruition. And we have Nakib Mohammed, one of the key founders of the project. We have Sharia expert, Dr. Farouk Habib, and CTO Denise um, in, in, in this fireside chat. And myself, Amir, I am the co-founder and investor at, at the Cinefy Group and very pleased to have this conversation with you. So Nikib, we met for the first time about 10 months ago when, when we started talking about Marhaba at the time, it was its an infancy. So many things have changed. Um, would you please give us sort of idea, um, how, how did you come up with this idea about Marhaba? And with your technical skills, you could easily start a million dollar company or join multi-billion dollar companies easily. But in fact, you did decide to quit your job and start a new journey. Uh, well, yes. <clears throat> uh, okay, so second question first. Why did I decide to quit a high paying job and, and take a leap of faith? Because it was taking a leap, leap, leap of faith being the only earning member of the family, uh, doing a safe and secure job from nine to five, no responsibilities in a senior position. So basically worry is less, as well as a, a, a high paying job in Saudi Arabia is good to have, you know, you, you don't want it to move out of the luxury zone. But then again, um, as I said, it was a leap of faith and that leap of faith was an effort to, um, to, create, to create a lasting impact, right? So this is where the journey started almost two years back when I was looking into a growing trend of industry 4.0 um, and I was looking at the Gartner prediction cycle and I noticed that <clears throat> industry 4.0 would be basically run on top of distributed ledger technologies like AI, machine learning, artificial intelligence, all of this are there as part of industry 4.0, but the underlying database um, would be um, a distributed ledger. So, so this is what in, uh, excited me. I am, I, uh, in no way I will consider brilliant in, in any field. Uh, not that I'm being humble, but that's the fact. Uh, so I said, uh, when I looked into AI, machine learning, artificial intelligence, I found that just not experts, but even Nobel prize winners are ruling that space and blockchain was, is in its infancy. It's still, it's still evolving. Standards have not been set. And just like me, everybody over there is uh, would be a learner. So this is something that excited me. Um, primary reason, the secondary reason was it had it, the, the technology is rebellious in nature. It is fighting for a cause. It is fighting for a cause that appeals to me. Um, that is removing friction, removing intermediaries. All, all uh, I mean, all the all the problems, all the basic problems that blockchain solves. So I I, I looked into blockchain. I did. I did have knowledge about Bitcoin, but I never looked into it. And when I understood that blockchain is actually the underlying technology of Bitcoin, um, uh, I intentionally kept myself away from learning more about Bitcoin and the financial side of cryptocurrencies because um, I, I wanted to understand the technology first. So as an enterprise architect myself, um, I, I started looking into the uh, technical side of blockchain, other use cases, uh, supply chain, and um, and self sovereign identity, uh, a lot of a lot of other use cases as well. Um, identity rights, um, land records, record keeping, so all uh, the enterprise um, use cases of blockchain basically. And then gradually 
as time moved on the garter prediction cycle didn't prove true where they had predicted that enterprise blockchain would would be the next thing by 2023 uh, but um, like we were end, we were coming close to the uh, to to the end of 2020 and we were we were seeing that the financial the enterprise use cases are actually going down but uh, financial use cases are picking up so this is where i started looking to defi and especially after the boom uh, that suddenly happened in defi because of compound and yen finance being listed in coinbase in june 2020 defi started catching my attention and i got an opportunity to start working on a on a defi uh, startup Uh, so this is where uh, that was my first interaction of defi and i never thought about the sharia aspect of it and in one of the interviews like this uh, somebody like you asked me about okay you are based in the middle east because i was based in riyadh at that time and what does defi uh, um, uh, say about no what does sharia say about defi so that was the first time somebody asked me this and uh, i had myself not thought about it i somehow managed the um just the same way i'll manage all the difficult questions that you asked me today and i somehow managed the conversation and after the call i started looking into it and i really found that um, the the defi industry is completely taken over by high interest based uh, mechanisms and solutions and there is actually nothing that that i could benefit from personally so when i saw that if i and i cannot benefit it means it is not for the islamic community and defi being Uh, solely to um, to bring adoption uh, inside the community to bring the unbanked um, uh, to to include the unbanked as part of the financial revolution it was not actually solving the purpose so this is where the idea of an inclusive defi started creeping in and i reached out uh, to people i knew and and this this is where the concept of marhaba started forming in well thank you so much and i keep that part of journey Well, Dr. Peru, very few people who understand Sharia and even probably fewer who understand cryptocurrency. You're one of the leading experts at this moment on the planet that I could think of. Um, why Sharia matters in DeFi and why it's ethical? So, okay, if you look at the complete body of Sharia, you would find that like it guides you in every walk of life. so it's not only about uh, a set of uh, a set of rulings uh, focusing on worship but it also focuses on uh, man to man uh, dealings transactions for example so if you look at the whole sharia bo- uh, the body of knowledge of sharia you will see that like it guides you in every small or big walk of life uh, and uh, it sheds light on every every aspect of it so that's why uh, 40 years back uh islamic finance industry is started because muslim at, uh, have been feeling uh, muslims have been uh, have been had been uh, thinking that okay how we can revive our economy on the basis of our faith and uh, and the sharia rulings so it uh, i can i can i saw that like there were some some uh, debates for the modern economy to to change it into an islamic economy back in 1940s 50s 60s and then afterwards that uh, discussion uh, diverted towards finance basically banking finance capital markets so in 1970s we saw that like many sharia scholars started talking about islamic banks and islamic finance itself why because there was a huge need because finance is basically a very important part of our everyday life and uh, if we are basically uh, uh, you, if we are, if someone basically wants to uh, follow his faith uh, his or her faith uh, according to sharia then uh, they also need to look after their finances because uh, if the finances are not sharia compliant then there is a huge huge aspect of your life which is being ignored uh, from the sharia perspective so that is basically the the problem itself and uh, uh i basically uh started focusing well from a very early stage on to become an islamic economist or islamic financial expert uh so uh, uh, basically i studied uh, sharia separately and then also uh, i studied modern uh, education for example uh, banking finance economics separately 
so that like I was able to basically see both the worlds and I was able to actually understand the issues and challenges on both sides, that how we can reconcile and then create something which is beneficial for the whole society. So uh, that is basically was my motive. And uh, uh, just like Nakib, actually what happened is uh, when I was uh, in, in, in back in Malaysia, I was, uh, I was living there back in 2014. So I was basically thinking to send money to, to my parents in Pakistan. And I was trying to basically see that what would be the most efficient way. Back in 2014, I, I stumbled upon BTC for Bitcoin, but of course, like it was not the most efficient way to send money. But the good thing about, was, uh, about it was that like uh, it attracted my attention because Islamic monetary policy is one of my area of interest. So I started looking at it from the monetary perspective that, okay, what is this phenomenon? How money is created in Islamic law and how it, what is the importance? What is the usage and, uh, and other Sharia issues surrounding money and monetary policy? So I started studying that uh, in back in 2014. And then uh, afterwards, basically I started the uh, evaluating other crypto assets as well and created my own uh, sort of like a crypto screening criteria and how to categorize them accordingly and how to issue Sharia ruling on them. Well, let me do the follow-up question. To my best knowledge in Sharia, interest is not allowed and defined by definition as purely interest-based experimental sort of industry. Um, would you please give us an idea um, how do you, how does the screening work and how does Marhaba stand out from the crowd? Mm -hmm. One thing, uh, so like uh, by definition, DeFi is not interest-based, it's just decentralized finance. So now you have a choice whether you want to do finance in a Sharia compliant manner or you want to do finance in an interest-based uh, system. So that is basically a choice we have been given. So I, I saw this opportunity there because many people think, oh, if it is banking, no way you can do banking in a Sharia compliant manner. If it is DeFi, no way you can do it. So that is not the case, actually. You can, you can go back to the classical FIP and then you can derive rulings from there through Ijtihad. And Ijtihad is basically like using analogy. And uh, also you can, you, uh, you can basically derive uh, uh, cases uh, from from the and the Sharia rulings for them uh, from this classical film. So you can do that, and then you can make them relevant to your own scenario or situation. So, like we are talking about DeFi here, decentralized finance. So we can actually build something which is very original and uh, which is also derived from, directly from the classical film or the Islamic jurisprudence, uh, and apply those principles and rulings in the DeFi world. So this is basically the main concept uh, which we, uh, we, are, we have applied in Marhaba DeFi and uh, specifically how it is being implemented. So there are mainly uh, three, four aspects. Number one is basically we have a governance board. So we are not only one person, but uh, actually I am the chairman, but uh, I have my other colleagues, two colleagues, who are like qualified muftis and also uh, PhD scholars in Islamic finance. And uh, they are also trained in the classical fiqh. So because of that, they have expertise there. So like we all together actually uh, try to look at three main areas. And uh, number one is uh, the, the Islamicity or the Sharia compliance of Marhaba as an entity. MRHP DeFi as an entity. So like we need to look at its uh, partnerships, contractual relationships, et cetera, et cetera. Number two thing is actually the products we are offering. So can we basically see that what is the problem with the, with the current model? For example, if it is interest-based, can we just completely remove it and then introduce something which is Sharia compliant? That like uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Quran says that uh, uh, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has uh, forbid, uh, has forbidden riba interest and allowed trade or sale. So it, which means basically like 
we have an interest based system versus sale and trade based system in islamic finance so we have an alternative there so if we remove riba or interest from the defi we can introduce which is sale based which is uh, trade based so that is basically our concept first so in the products also we try to avoid every sharia prohibition and try to see like how we can innovate further and improvise so that like it will become a very original and uh, sharia based product that is the concept in our offering third thing is basically of course defi is super interconnected and because of that we cannot just basically uh, create an ecosystem in silo which is independent and separate from the rest of the defi space so so there has to be a connection but we need to ensure that that connection is also sharia compliant for example uh, when we are using third party protocols and uh, tokens in our products or in our offerings so of course like we need to also ensure that they are also sharia compliant thank you so very much there are so many questions in between and that's where denisia come in um denisia we're working for the 500 fortune companies in the world's most promising financial center in London. And you dare to quit your job and join Marhaba full time. Just give us an idea. How were you convinced to join full time before I go ahead with my initial question? Um, so I was I actually came across Marhaba while I was looking for a solution for myself. Um, so my solution that I was looking for is a, a form to pay is account in crypto. And I spoke to a few people um, and it was just basically no way to do it uh, without sort of um, jumping 10 loops. So while I was searching for this solution, I came across an article on Cointelegraph, I think it was where I saw Marhaba and I reached out in the group and then we started chatting with Nikib, explained my background and then he eventually picked up from there because of what the project was aiming to do and the idea, it it, it just strike home and it basically um, addressed all the pain points that I've I've myself personally experienced till date and being able to build a solution that uh, addresses all these pain points I knew it wasn't just me because I have obviously uh, a friend circle I have my family who are going through the same things and I thought well if I can build a solution then just do it like take a leap of faith and do it rather than work for a corporate um, where I'm basically potentially even helping them raise interest uh, through the software that we're building, why not uh, take that job out of the equation and build a system, build a new system where technology, blockchain technology allows us to remove the interest system and rebuild the entire financial system um, completely. Where, uh, of course, it's going to take time. It's not like we're going to take over the banking sector and uh, destroy the banks in, 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 two day, in two years. But over time, with technologies, um, with what blockchain technology gives us, I think the financial sector, fintech, um, will change completely. And uh, based on that vision and long-term sight, uh, it didn't take much convenience, to be honest. I, I, I was on board. Well, that's very fascinating. So it wasn't initially a financial purpose behind, but one of the a pinpoint that you were sort of trying to figure out, which leads to my next question. When Dr. Farouk was explaining the three points, one of them was a key word, a connection because blockchain is interconnected, the infrastructure is all interconnected. And mm -hmm. the ambition that Mar Marhaba has, a multiple products, it's a very ambitious project. Each product could become a multi-million dollar business in itself. Um, how technically do you think the tech team under your command and leadership could build a secure, promising, and scalable infrastructure that Marhaba is set to build? Yeah, so um, we have a large team. I think we have about 10 developers now full time um, and it's obviously going to grow with time and with funding. Um, so I, I have full faith in my, in my development team because of their previous experiences, what they've built before. And uh, based on my personal experiences as well, I can bring uh, quite a bit to the table as well. And when you combine all those, um, I, I expect all our products to launch as expected. But having said that, we do not necessarily write entire um, each 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 one of our products from scratch. We try to build on the shoulders of the giants, and we remove pieces that are not Sharia compliant. So um, that's basically general software engineering, right? You don't want to reinvent the wheel. You want to build what somebody else has built, 
and then add a layer on top, add a feature on top and an open source stack and see what others can build on top of what you built. And then with that sort of, uh, with that sort of given back to the community in terms of technology, we're all gonna get to a better place eventually. Um, so that's what Mahaba is doing um, overall when we're developing. So any of our products, when you look at it, we try to pick up already existing DeFi Lego blocks and add a layer on top, add the Sharia filter and add the Sharia process on top and um, execute in, in the quickest uh, possible uh, development time um, without sort of um, hiring 50, 60 developers to, to accomplish our goals. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. I want to get back on those three killer products that I had been reading in a white paper, but I keep back to you. When you were starting in the beginning, um, you were alone, obviously, and Marhaba prides itself one of the rare breeds that convinced scores of retail investors to invest more than uh, other VCs. If you could give an idea how, how about your patience and tolerance and pitching skills, um, more than probably 20 people I could think of that invested their, their you know, savings believing in you as a leader and believing in the project and its vision, how it all happened and, and just give us sort of idea about your emotions and feelings and the moment when at the end of the day, once you got your first important funding, you just probably ended up crying, being happy. Well, you uh, you are touching on on very delicate words. Um, I'll try to best I'll try best to frame my words uh, because there are certain uh, feelings that you cannot express, and this is one of them because you know it is difficult to to continue staying motivated when you have a uh, when you are when you are running on a dream, it is difficult to stay motivated when your dream is termed as a scam. It's difficult to stay motivated when you are termed as a as a, as a fraud. But um, I, I knew that uh, what I'm doing is is right. I knew that the people who are gradually joining me in my in my journey are believing in the same vision, and that is why if you see when you talk to each one of us in the team, they will probably give you the same story of why they joined. For example, you asked Denise, right, why he joined. He probably gave you the same story as, as, what, as what I told you about my uh, starting point. So everybody in the team over here is, is there because they have, uh, they, they shared a common vision. And when we started talking to investors, potential investors, and we like, we took almost, uh, Dr. Farooq, almost one year plus, 11, 12 months plus to reach up to a point where we started fundraising. All this time, we were working on concepts, refining ideas, brainstorming, getting the right people to understand what we are doing, getting the right supports. All of this took almost one year plus time. And when we reached to a fundraising status, we made sure that we transfer our passion, our vision to the people we are talking to. For example, the first three or four investors we signed up, we didn't even have a pitch deck in place. We didn't have a pitch deck. I didn't share my screen. I didn't show them anything. I just spoke to them and I explained them what we are doing and what we are planning to do and what potential the project might have if we get the right support uh, uh, from them. And they just believed me. And they, just like Denise, they took a leap of faith as well. So, so this is how things started moving on. And like one gear moved the second gear and gradually the engine started moving, moving on. But yes, even now we are signing up investors. We are in a position where we are, where we are um, apologetically saying no to a lot of investors, uh, which we do not want to. We, we, are trying to. we are trying our best to accommodate as many investors as possible. But then again, coming up to this stage was not easy. Um, I don't want to go into all those uh, bad experiences. You know, I won't, I mean, I won't uh, agree uh, that no project has a bad experience. I mean, it's a, it's the same show, you know, every founder has his own challenge. Every startup has his own challenge. Amir, you are a business owner as well. You, you would have faced a lot of challenges in setting up some fire. Uh, so, so, so that's pretty common. But what really matters is that uh, the vision is clear. The focus is clear. Um, I give tremendous amount of, um, of credit to my family. They supported me uh, entirely when I took the uh, decision of leaving my job and taking this full time, even though there was no, no near um, promise of the funds coming in and, uh, and I taking care of my, uh, of my monthly savings. But all of this, you know, was 
happening in parallel with only one belief that this can work up. and the, the tremendous team that was that was being added up that was being built on we had the same passion and this is how we mo- we moved on but yes the first investment what is very memorable it was a 4000 uh, dollar sign up the first investment i will not share the name obviously uh, it was from a retail investor he doesn't know as well that he was the first retail investor this is this is something only i know it but yes that 4000 dollars itself meant a lot uh, that was like um, that was the inauguration of 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 our dream coming true and then then one by one we started signing investors retails looking started coming in uh, vc started coming in we are one of those very few projects which is backed more by retail and very very less uh, by the vcs and we are planning to continue the same style as well for example the next uh, two rounds that we have we have given a sufficient allocation so that retail investors who still want to be part of the private sale uh, pre sale they are able to participate so we are we are trying our best to give this opportunity to retail investors because you know defi in particular it's meant for the community right it's not meant for uh, it's not meant for the rich people to to come in and lock their funds and and make more money out of the already huge amount of money they have you know so uh, it's it's actually meant for the for the for the common man like all of us and giving an opportunity to, to them is very important and most of the defi projects i have seen like this they literally they sell sell it off they sell off the project to vcs i mean the few vcs we have we have an issue with them as well i mean they want to dictate the project no the vesting has to be like this the token price has to be like this i mean they don't understand the vision right i mean uh, i mean i under, i i i don't put them at a fault because uh, they have an obligation to their liquidity provider but then again there there is a specific target this this project has to achieve and all of us we are taking considerable steps and considerable of uh, amount of of uh, of i mean we are being extremely careful to protect our interest so this is how we are moving forward sorry i couldn't bring oh, the okay. tears that's okay you don't have to that's okay <laughs> coming back to the point when we started talking 9 months back um there was one of the key words that i really liked so you you mentioned that you were not reinventing the wheel by solving technical problem but you were motivated essentially by the social impact of the project would you please elaborate what did you mean by social impact okay so look there are uh, amazing projects out there in defi and there are amazing projects being built in defi as we speak every 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 10 10 minutes uh if i mean if your notifications are on on those um important channels in telegram you will find some some of the other project being uh, closing their 5 million funding round 8 million funding round 20 million funding round i mean money is is um, amazingly massive in this industry right so all of them are amazing projects great projects solving really really nice issues you know as as many said that you build uh on top of some existing code and you Uh, you create a product and somebody you outsource open source it and somebody else builds on top of it so this is how defi is moving ahead you know this entire industry is an experiment as, as of now as we speak it will take time to get mature to get the standard set and whoever uh, sustains whoever builds a sustainable solution uh, is is there for long term that is guaranteed so uh, i mean when when we looked into the defi ecosystem i mean as I, as i mentioned initially uh we found that even though defi is meant for global adoption it is meant for um for solving the complexity of the financial systems it is meant for bringing the unbanked to the uh, to the uh, to the financial um uh, financial circle but it was not solving the purpose because a huge percentage of population which is uh, primarily the islamic population which is like 24% uh, in among the global community is staying out of this because of the faith issues right i mean dr farooq would be knowing it better he, he would be he would be understanding the pain of how much people would be asking the same questions again and again okay is bitcoin sharia compliant is the file sharia compliant i mean probably he would be giving i mean he would be having a tape recorder probably with the answers ready like anybody asked just please it but yeah but this is a basic problem that this community is facing because because of which the community is not able to onboard the defi ecosystem okay forget about understanding i mean they don't even want to come 
understand and then decide if it is Sharia compliant. Or not. They just they just stay. They maintain a distance from it. So if we don't bring the people to this, how are they going to benefit from from this financial revolution that's taking place? And this is the social impact that we are talking about and that we are trying to solve. We are trying to make our system so approachable and so easy. Even if you see our white paper, it's not. It doesn't contain mathematical formulas that you will not understand. It is so nicely written, and like I mean, the team has really impressed me with the the quality of white paper that they have written. It's it's so easy to understand, even for a non-technical guy, that he will feel like reading it more and exploring the system. Even though uh, he'll say, "Okay, I don't trust the Sharia scholars because they are not from my region, they are not from my school of thought." But okay, at least let me get on boarded and let me let me try to understand it myself. So you know, we are trying to open the gate to a huge amount of non-crypto community. And this non-crypto community, once they are on board, only then you can actually present your solutions to them and 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 make them understand uh, about the potential that's, that's lying out there. Because you believe it or not, and you accept it or not, this is the next financial uh, evolution that's taking place, and we are. We are at a very, very nascent stage, and if we don't help the community to be part of it, many of them would be left out from benefiting from it. So this is the social impact we are trying to create, and it's obviously not excluding the technical innovation as well. Denise can can elaborate on that how we are taking care of the uh, technical innovation as well on this platform. But yes, um, the the social impact is uh, our, our major focus over uh, in building this ecosystem. Oh, thank you so much. To to extend my question related to social impact, um, Dr. Farooq, uh, Marhaba has two types of boards, which is very unique sort of value proposition. Would you please elaborate how does the Sharia board works versus the uh, the governance board where Khaled is a chairman, and why does two different boards really matter? Yeah, so I think that this is very unique to to Marhaba DeFi. I think that this is the only uh, project where we have like two governance board. So first we have a uh, uh, Sharia governance board, which actually filters all sort of things. For example, like whether it is partnership, whether it is a uh, contractual relationship, or if in the introduction of a, of a new product or developing a new product, doing some research, or even like any governance matter. So first, Sharia, there is Sharia Governance Board, SGB of Marhaba, that take filters out every non-Sharia compliant activity or product or service or any other idea even. <laughs> and uh, only once it is approved by the SGB, then it can be put to uh, put to the consideration of um, uh, MGB, which is uh, Marhaba uh, Governance Board. So that is basically a general board, but uh, of course, uh, uh, we have a very good harmony between the two governance boards. So, for example, like the first one, it actually acts as a filter. So, filter out anything which is not Sharia compliant, then it would not be relevant to Marhaba DeFi. Only Sharia compliant things would be relevant to it. And then, we out of those uh, things, or like the whole Sharia compliant universe only, then we can take decisions, MGB can take decisions in terms of uh, whether we would like to have uh, uh, a partnership or contractual relationship or, or a product or our or, or marketing strategy or whatever it is. So, but then everything has to be uh, Sharia compliant there. So what we, this, the good thing about this approach is that it's end-to-end -end Sharia compliant. It's not like uh, Sharia, experts come in and they only see the product document and then they certify that whether this product is Sharia compliant or not. So like SGB, the member of the SGB are being in, involved in, uh, in, in the idea, ideation, ideation also in the, in, the, in the brainstorming sessions and in the, in the decision making and uh, also in the research. So like every step of product or any any process within the Marhaba DeFi ecosystem uh, is being uh, uh, is being basically approved by the Sharia Sharia SGB board. And uh, another thing, good thing about it is that like SGB also has representation at the MGB level. So that like if let's suppose that at MGB level something comes up directly to them, so we can also again filter it out or or we can approve it from the Sharia perspective. So I think that it's like a very comprehensive and end-to-end -end approach towards being Sharia compliant.
Okay, let me come back to the point of social impact and how Sharia compliance works in the context of making some tough decisions. So we spoke multiple times and this concept of riba mentioned several times in a white paper. So would you please give us in a very plain English, what is riba and how do you ensure the operations that will be taking place on Marhaba ecosystem, they will be riba free because Uniswap compound and scores of other projects, it's all about technically speaking, quote unquote riba. Uh, so if you look at the concept of riba, I, I, I actually personally uh, prefer to use the terminology riba although like it has been translated as interest and usury, but the concept of interest and usury is very narrow because they are uh, these terminologies are confined to uh, a lending and borrowing mechanism. But RIBA is basically more than that. It's an Islamic concept where any unjustified compensation is considered not permissible within, in, a, in, a, in a contractual relationship. So interest also falls in it because Sharia sees uh, lending and borrowing as an act of charity. So like helping out people. So when you lend somebody some loan, definitely it would be out of the need. So you should not be expecting any, any financial return uh, uh, for that kind of activity or mechanism. Uh, so that is why when Sharia sees it as a charity mechanism, so you should not be able to, you should not be uh, accepting interest uh, for, for lending loan. But if you would like to go for the financial returns and profit, you are, you are most welcome to, to become the partner, partner in, the, in the business activity itself. So you can basically invest your capital and become a partner or a capital provider or investor. And then you will be able to actually uh, entitled to, to receive profits and returns from the business activity. So that is basically the Islamic concept where any unjustified compensation is not allowed. Now, how we are stopping it into in, in Marhaba DeFi ecosystem. So if you can see that right now, we do not have uh, any uh, product which is based on lending and borrowing mechanism, number one. And uh, number two is, uh, is that uh, we are also trying to have pure partnership contract. For example, I think that uh, uh, if uh, uh, you might have seen in our white paper and Dennis can also elaborate on this and uh, that liquidity harvester is our product, which is based on the, on the Islamic concept of Mubaraba, like a business partnership. So where you people are going to invest and then only they become partners and only then they will be entitled to the profits. So that's how basically we are trying to avoid uh, our best to avoid any sort of riba. Uh, and you would be amazed to know that uh, even if you look at the DeFi space currently, uh, not it's a concept that okay everything in the DeFi is riba based, but it is sometimes it is it is not. So so you would I was also got amazed when I was. Uh, uh, doing some research on certain protocols. And I found that even those protocols in their white paper use the terminology that it is interest and lending and borrowing. But when I dissect it, I found that it was not a lending and borrowing mechanism and it is not interest perhaps. If I may follow up real quick. So um, in, in the staking and DeFi, there is terminology called APY and APR. So in case of Marhaba, how does it work? And I remember when we started our sort of conversations earlier, a couple of weeks ago, you were educating several of our partners about the differences, how it works on Uniswap or Compound and how it's going to work in Marhaba. If you could give an idea like how the differences and, and how it's going to manifest those newbies start using Marhaba in the long run. Mm -hmm. So although like we have maintained uh, some terminology so that like people will not uh, feel like uh, that, th that this project is very alien. So like we are still, sometimes we use uh, APR for annual percentage return or APY annual percentage yield. But of course we need to understand that where this return or yield is coming from. 
what is the source of it so if it is the source is like a lending and borrowing mechanism and then we are reaping this sort of yield of course it would not be sharia compliant but if let's suppose that we change the mechanism there it is not a lending and borrowing mechanism but rather than investing somewhere and then you 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 basically reap the the yield out of that mechanism then of course like you call, you can call it profit you can call it return or yield doesn't matter but the underlying concept has been changed and because of that uh, it it is sharia compliant so that is basically the main difference between marhaba defi and other sort of yields although like sometimes we do use those terminologies uh, so that like people can get an idea but of course like the underlying concept has been changed so in other words marhaba is a fund manager and i'm an investor yeah so for example like if you come and you would like to use liquidity harvester so you would come as an investor and then marhaba defi will act as a investment manager and then we will be actually uh, investing the, uh, the liquidity of funds uh, into sharia compliant activities only and uh, the profit will be shared between marhaba and the investors that's a pretty good point because liquidity harvester um one of the killer products as it's uh, has been stated multiple times when um, the entire team was pitching to multiple investors. Some of them were hooked instantly. And Denise, you're one of the, uh, probably the brains be behind the liquidity harvester, Soak NFT, Sahal Wallet. And the roadmap is designed for almost, probably could be designed for 10 years in terms of its execution, making it bulletproof. Would you please sort of elaborate in terms of the technical developments and why people have to hold Marhaba tokens rather than selling them in a in a better long term? Sure. So in terms of technical developments, um, Marhaba is, although the token itself, MRHP, will be uh, minted initially on Binance Smart Chain, uh, the protocol itself is actually chain agnostic in that all of our products are attempting to integrate with chains that have liquidity, that have uh, growth, and that have user base um, number of addresses grown on a on a day to day or month to month basis. So essentially, the the product, the ecosystem that we're building, is uh, sort of chasing um, growth and not sticking to a single chain. This gives us the flexibility to offer many products and allow our user base to access many different chains through a single ecosystem. Um, that's the same with the liquidity harvester, for example. We, we want to become a liquidity gateway for all chains that we integrate with. So if we're integrating with Algorand today, our aim for Algorand would be to increase the amount of liquidity on Algorand, but in return, actually make a return for our end users uh, where they profit from it and they make they make they make something out of it as well. It's not just the Algorand uh, blockchain where it's growing liquidity. Um, it's it's the same concept throughout our all throughout each of our products. And uh, we have chosen each of these products uh, based on um, based on sort of experiences that we've had, where we see the DeFi space going and um, which which areas there were gaps in. Um, so that that's that's basically uh, how we came about with the ecosystem. I mean, um, the products that we're building are challenging, but as I said, nothing has been built from grounds up apart from a few things, of course. Um, we do have some in-house uh, innovative solutions like the Trailblazer API and um, ability to split orders, ability to bridge to many EVM and non-EVM chains. Um, but a majority of the models that we're chasing are already in existence. We're just building a layer on top. I want to follow up on NFT. NFT is probably one of the most probably booming industry. And yeah. Chariot must allow and does not allow specifics in terms of what could be positioned. How does the screening going to work technically speaking? Is it going to be a machine learning solution or human engagement? Yeah, so this is an interesting one because I, when I first had this discussion with Dr. Farouk, I thought uh, non-Sharia compliant NFTs would be basically uh, nudity, adult content. But it turns out it's much more than that. It's 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 it could be, it could be anything that triggers negative thoughts, right? Um, so we need to have some sort of uh, filtration, and obviously filtering everything through a manual process is not scalable. Because when you think about how NFT marketplaces grow today, um, you could start with ten NFTs being created on a daily basis, and then expand up to ten thousand NFTs being created on a daily basis. So we need to have some sort of filtration process. And that filtration process for us is uh, through um, AI and uh, machine learning. 
So we're, we're currently integrating and building uh, a few adult content, hate speech and racism uh, sort of content filtering AI models that is, so we, we, we actually have two layers, two, two layers of filtering. So the first layer is uh, doing the same thing and it will give us a score between zero and 10. So zero and one. Um, depending on that score, it would go to the second filtration system, which is again, a machine learning piece. Um, and again, if that gives us a score that's similar to the first one, then we pass that NFT uh, on hold and we send it off to our Sharia board uh, governance dashboard, which is completely independent. And it's for uh, Dr. Farouk's team to actually review manually and see if it can be uh, posted or not. And depending on the, the outcome of, of that judgment uh, through, the, through the Sharia governance board, we will rather we would um, either approve it or reject it. If the rejection is made, then a reason must be supplied. And even those reasons are being accumulated and collected as data sets to actually teach our algorithms going forward um, what they should be looking out for. So over time, our, our algorithms should get better at detecting um, basically Sharia, non-Sharia compliant content. And that would give us the flexibility and scalability in, in, the, in the long run as the data set grows so that we don't have to rely on manual manpower and uh, sort of take everything to Dr. Farouk and his board. Um, yeah, that's, that, that's, the, that's how we plan to make this filtration system work uh, for specifically the NFT product, NFT marketplace. Yeah, it does sound a lot of work behind the scenes, obviously. Um, I'm going to follow up on that question, but I want to go ahead and ask Nakeep. One of the breaking news, I believe 48 hours um, ago, um, we got the news that Algebra decided to join and invest in Marhaba. We don't have to specify about the digits, but Algebra is one of the most prominent fintech company um, in the UK, and they have fantastic supporters. One of the, the biggest names is Humayun Sheikh, who had a deal with Google selling um, the deep learning for $400 million. So how does Marhaba is going to work with Algebra and what would be the nature of the partnership within the European Union and how will it be translated across Arabic and non-Arabic speaking countries? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> well, you are well updated of the latest happenings. So, Algebra um, is, a, a, is a financial startup, regulated financial startup, uh, which is which has been invested uh, upon by uh, NWG, New World Group, and Mosaic uh, Ventures. So, these are the parent organizations that invested in in, in Marhaba Algebra directly. So the, the people who created Algebra and the, the venture that is backing Algebra is the venture that invested in, in, in our project as well. The intention of it is to start a lasting relationship uh, that starts with the investment and uh, backing to us, but it will actually go on. How we are planning to uh, collaborate and work together is something that we will we will work on gradually as the time proceeds because they are in the, uh, in the conventional um, financial ecosystem. They are in the CFI ecosystem and we are in the DeFi ecosystem. And the way the financial um, um, system is evolving, uh, everybody is either thinking about crypto or CBDCs or, or, or the uh, institutional side of DeFi for FIs, right? So... <clears throat> So this is where um, the collaboration will work out. Like instead of they reinventing the wheel, um, they would. Uh, I mean, we would explore how um, the DeFi services that the DeFi solutions that MRHB is building would be integrated to the uh, CFI services over there, so that we, we we are successfully able to bridge the gap of CFI and DeFi. Like coming up with a, probably a hybrid model called CDFI. You know, CDFI is. Uh, uh, a lot in talks nowadays, especially as more and more regulations are are uh, are entering into the industry. As more of um, uh, people are trying to in, involve KYC and and AML policies, which actually takes the spirit of DeFi out of them. So the new term that's being used for these kind of solutions is actually CDFI, centralized DeFi, where you do control who enters, but then again uh, the, the network controls what you do once you enter the system. So <clears throat> this is probably, we will explore how and, and when 
um this is uh, going to proceed this is like a gradual process this is very early uh, amir sir as you rightfully said it's like just 48 hours of the news and um, i mean we are a startup and so is algebra uh, we will gradually explore how we can work together but yes the relationship has started with a very positive note with they backing us uh, backing us uh, means that they believe in our vision they believe in what we are planning to do they believe that what we are planning to do would actually would actually be impactful enough so they decided to to uh, to, uh, to support us in our journey okay well dr farooq um i want to follow up based on our discussion with denise in terms of nft so sharia law has a very specific explanation about the um the visual identity of anything in any form and shape um from your well you you have been a scholar you are still a scholar you are a researcher you have a almost over a decade of experience working for multiple institutions especially in malaysia and now you are part of a startup and i'm extremely interested and curious that because nft industry the booming one what does the sharia say about nft if i could ask this naive question and what would be the nature of future development of nft in the in the framework or in the context of sharia the technicalities aside but just to look at the concept and philosophy of it so if you look at the nft non fungible tokens by its nature from the technical perspective it's just a token and it has been generated by a system which is unique and uh, it is non fungible which means that like uh, you can price it but you cannot replace it with an exactly same nft so that is basically the concept but so from the sharia perspective there is nothing wrong from the technology uh, on the technology point on the or the technology side but of course you we need to understand and see that what does this nft represent because it's a digital representation of something so what what is it behind it so if it is a an art form for example be it a video or 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 a or a digital uh, digital photo so then we need to see that where that video or a digital photo is sharia compliant or not if it is sharia compliant then nft will be become sharia compliant as well but i think that uh, if you look at the trend of the nft so i don't think that they will Uh, remain constrained within the boundaries of uh, art and music i think that uh, nfts are going to change many things in the world and then they are going to uh, basically represent anything which is uh, which is available and scarce in the real world uh, and then uh, the scarcity and uniqueness can be maintained in the digital world of the same thing as well so so nfts can be used for for real estates uh for uh, properties and nfts can be used for for certification nfts can be used for other purposes so i think that uh, we always go back and see that what does that nft do what does it represent and what is the source of value so if we can find it out and then see that whether it is sharia compliant or not then of course like uh, that nft can be sharia compliant so this is basically the main concept from the sharia aspect that's very helpful you just mentioned about the uh, um real estate in real estate um has very close connection with working with the banking institutions and you have worked with a banking institution back in malaysia from correct um how does defi especially sharia compliant defi in your opinion could be integrated into banking system in countries like indonesia singapore malaysia because there are some conservative countries for example um i don't know if iran is considered conservative in terms of its banking system um but i believe i have been to malaysia several times it's a liberal open but it's still it looks like the sharia is one of the dominant um compliance or legislation where it's applied the, to make my question even shorter how do you see defi sharia compliant defi in this case marhaba uh being integrated into um uh, islamic financial institutions within malaysia indonesia brunei Saudi Arabia or, or GCC countries for example so i think that uh, number one with if you look at the nfts or even the whole defi phenomena so nfts are going to change because uh, they are also evolved getting it also like one nft can actually represent a very sophisticated contractual relationship and a financial product itself and uh, there is a huge amount of islamic or sharia compliant assets there 
and we can tokenize them through uh, in the in the DeFi space so that like we can attract the liquidity on the one side on on one side and on the other side we can provide them sharia compliant assets so this is basically a very huge and good combination uh the way i see that like how defi can be integrated with islamic finance i think it's uh, it's basically only a matter of time uh because uh, even uh, when we see indonesia for example uh, you would be amazed to know that most of the fintech startups are coming in islamic fintech startups are coming from indonesia although like uh, uh, from the economic scale you may see that like it's a very conservative or underdeveloped country but uh, fin uh, crypto and uh, fintech has been very popular islamic from the islamic perspective in indonesia malaysia is also one of the one of the key players in the islamic fintech side so i think that uh, uh, it's only and regulations are coming in by the way so i think that regulations proper regulations even like uh, uh, uae is one of the good example we are like a week ago they have also also announced that they are going to introduce crypto regulations so opening an exchange doing some trading or even like in issuing tokens or uh, issuing projects uh, on blockchain it would be would be regular regulated and also very very much in, uh, easy so with those regulation i think that the mass population will have confidence and trust on defi phenomena and the products offering and because of that i can see that like the institutions would have more comfort zone to interact with the DeFi phenomena and DeFi projects. So Marhaba DeFi, I think that would be the front runner in that sense that uh, it can actually be the, the first choice of Islamic financial institutions when it comes to interact with the DeFi space. In other words, just to summarize what you just said, that's the question of time and evolution, how centralized institutions are going to accept, digest, and start gradually opening their doors for newly developed DeFi products. Uh, yeah, so regulations actually will pave the way for them to walk on and, and find the DeFi and cross through the uh, cross, uh, gateway of DeFi. If I could do something additional, I wasn't planning, it just popped up on my head. As you know, um, in, we're Sharia dominant countries. Let's talk about, um, in this case, GCC countries. Um, how do you make your argument to, let's say, conservative imams or muftis that have zero knowledge about cryptocurrency or what, what DeFi is all about, um, but they purely look from the conservative Sharia perspective, purely from Islamic finance perspective? How would you make that case for them so they could technically at least start opening, op, um, opening up and engage into dialogue with you? I think that uh, this is very, very easy and straightforward. Uh, I do not get to get engaged with them uh, in an argument, but rather I would try to basically focus on education and awareness. Because I really know that uh, Sharia scholars, be it from the GCC conservative uh, uh, area or any, any liberal area, they are very, very objective and uh, they are open-minded. So if they know that, okay, this is basically the technology, and this is how we are going to use it. And this is basically the main objective. Of course, like they, they, they will be able to understand, not only they will be able to understand, but definitely they will support it. And that's basically happening to Marhaba DeFi. We have been receiving so many uh, interest and uh, so many, uh, uh, by the, uh, I mean, calls and uh, also support from different corners of the world where Sharia scholars want to know this phenomena so that only they can understand and basically promote it in their own domain. Thank you so much, Dr. Farouk, for, for elaborating. So Denise, I was looking into Robin Hood, which reinvented the art of investment. And I look at the Marhaba's utility tokens. During our initial calls on several occasions, you gave your argument why users have to keep their tokens. And you give an example about multiple other projects where they, they, their token have not, has not any value, but they have a project. But Marhaba utility tokens have multiple applications. If you could sort of give us an idea about token usability, why it matters, and why for long-term holders, it would be a sort of um, positive thing or, or sure. great investment. Sure, yeah. 
Um, so when you look at the ecosystem we're building, it's made out of eight products for now anyway. We plan to have introduced a couple more. Um, each of these products are subject to a fee model. And this fee model is always tied back to our MRHP token. So without having the token itself, you won't be taking full advantage of what the system is providing you. That's in terms of unlocking features, that's in terms of reducing fees, that's in terms of uh, making returns through um, compounding and staking uh, um, MRHP in our own pools and so on. And on top of that, MRHP token itself will actually serve as an API key um, for business to business integration. So if a business wants to integrate with our services, they can do so through our API access, but that will be subject to MRHP ownership. And um, as we are one of the first to the market, we can, in, in terms of Sharia compliant DeFi, we can see, and we can see a lot of potential in terms of how many businesses that would want to integrate with our service so they can offer Sharia compliant, um, uh, Sharia compliant service. So for example, if you're compound, and you want to you want to be inclusive, more inclusive, um, and you want to offer Sharia compliance services, rather than building the Sharia compliance and doing the regulatory yourself, which is difficult. Um, why not just integrate with Maraba and uh, use what we have as a technology? So you, you you basically abstract away all the complexities of Sharia and leave that to us, and or work on your business logic and work on your DAP logic. That's the kind of uh, that's the kind of demand that we were foreseeing. And aside from that, of course, the, as I mentioned, every product has a fee model attached to it. Um, and this fee model will be dropped um, according to how many MRHP you're holding. Um, and you could reduce your fees by qu uh, quite drastically if, if you hold enough MRHP. Um, and then aside from that, we, we want to build um, compound and LP, to uh, LP tokens, uh, sorry, LP pools, which basically means if you stake MRHP, and you get LP tokens in return, you can even stake those LP tokens so you're earning double the rewards. But to be able to obviously earn, start earning those rewards, you need to have the MRHP token in the first place. Um, and on top of that, um, if that's not enough for you, we have a whole range of uh, utilities for the token itself. Because we are so many products, um, the, the token justifies its existence. Whereas if you look at uh, any other DeFi project, uh, I mean, I don't want to point any fingers and say, look, they're doing a bad job, but any, any DeFi project that you can think of right now um, in terms of uh, lending, borrowing or uh, liquidity pools, et cetera, they all have their tokens, but all they do and all they promise to do is governance, which is basically a voting right. The same uh, feature applies for us, but what we're promising on top is much more than uh, what, the, what our competitors are promising. And on top of all that wrapped up, it's a deflationary token. So with usage and with growth and uh, with interaction with the platform, the number of tokens in circulation over time will drop. So whatever you hold in your hand will uh, hopefully, inshallah, will become more precious. So uh, it, it's a good incentive uh, to hold these tokens and not sell it uh, for, I don't know, uh, for quick flips uh, as they do in today's, today's DeFi, DeFi ecosystem but uh, to think long-term and see where Maraba could be in the next four or five years um, uh, and see, see, see what we're trying to actually achieve and uh, fill a massive void in, in, the, in the market. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Denise. That reminded me the conversation with Nakeep where he gave an example. Nakeep, if you could tell that story yourself, you, 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 were, giving the, you were making the case. That was a good argument, saying that on one hand, According to Sharia law, interest is prohibited. So technically, people, when they go to the bank, they have to make use of their sort of resources. And in and, and today's bank, if they work according to Sharia law, it, it, it's kind of difficult mission. But if they invest in the Marahaba, we're talking about at least 10 and above in terms of the, the, the return that they can have. If you could, just in a simple, plain English, explain to somebody like me and other um, members of the of, of, of our partners who might be very interested. How how is it going to work from the financial standpoint? Why people have to invest in Tamarhaba to participate in upcoming IDO or potential investors who are ethical and yet have um, they have limited knowledge of, of DeFi? Why they have to invest? 
very simple question. We are a very promising project, and there's a lot of scope and potential um, in in how we grow. And if you see our roadmap, it's not a small roadmap. At least we are talking about a decade-long plan. Okay, so we are here to stay. So. <clears throat> Uh, at least, I, I like I have been an investor in multiple DeFi projects, and I've always invested in the team and um, and uh, and the understanding they have about what they're building, and not about what they uh, what I mean, where the token is going or what are the token prices. It's shooting up on day one and shooting ten times on day two, not like that. So um, we are one of uh, we are uh, like we have a similar. As well, and we will focus always on building our technology, building our products, and creating more and more utilities for a token, which will eventually, um, uh, which will eventually affect the price of uh, of the underlying token. Okay, so these are the reasons why anybody should invest in in this project. Uh, but yeah, if you talk about plain simple English about how it will create an impact, well, look. Um, in my opinion, if you talk about uh, the product liquidity hunt, which is our killer product, our AAA product, as Alex calls it, our AAA product. Okay, so um, me being a uh, Muslim, I have my savings in 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 bank. Okay, so name of the bank is Bank A, and it's probably a savings of ten thousand dollars, and this ten thousand dollars stays ten thousand dollars even if I. Um, if I choose to withdraw it after ten years, probably. Okay, maybe the bank would have added some interest, which I cannot use as a Muslim, or maybe it would even go down because the bank would be charging those uh, maintenance fees and everything. So ten ten thousand dollars would even go down to maybe nine thousand dollars some some change after ten years if I withdraw. But if I choose to convert this money into stable coins and move the location from the bank to the liquidity house to pool, okay. So what I'm doing is I'm just changing the location. And I'm converting into stable coins, so I'm being saved from the volatility of the crypto market, and uh, being saved of the problem of the impermanent loss that all coins have. Then I am in a position to earn Sharia compliant, perfectly halal rewards of uh, what the team is um, working on between like five to fifteen percent. Denise, is that the number between five to fifteen percent? And that will Eventually, that will be more and more optimized and increased as we go down the roadmap. So it's it's all about changing my location from my bank to the liquidity pool of the liquidity harvester, and then um, I have a very good place where I'm earning passive income. So I don't find a single reason why me being a Muslim, I will not use liquidity harvester as my point of storage. Why shall I put it in my bank? Uh, I don't have any bonds or I don't have any any locks. That will prevent me from withdrawing my my uh, my uh, funds from the liquidity harvester. There is no hard comments, uh, hard commitments that needs to be done. At the same time, the ten thousand dollars always stays ten thousand dollars. Plus, it's borderless. I can I can go to I can travel to any country. I can use it. I can liquidate it, and uh, it's it saved all all those banking crashes, the uh, uh, the weekends, the public holidays, everything. So. It's, it's a perfect financial replacement. So I mean, it's, if we are able to convey the right story, then we are creating a disruption on day one of a launch. So I mean, this is a this is a perfect belief that I have. Dennis, Dennis, excuse me for being slightly skeptical and very cautious. Yes, there have been a lot of scams in the industry and a lot of hacks in the industry. For argument's yeah. sake, I heard Nikib and I believe him as the human being. He is very ethical. And I put all my money from bank to liquidate a harvester. Mm -hmm. How does Marhaba ensure security? And what has been done to keep the sure. security on a level that we all expect it to be? So we do have a security partner, official security partner, which is Hacken. So every single smart contract that we smart contract that we're going to deploy to any uh, chain, because we are a chain agnostic company, uh, will be subject to uh, uh, security audits. Um, so we want to run it by Hacken first, and then we have a second security audit firm that we're speaking to, to have a double security audit. And then aside from that, we have now uh, formed a partnership with a company, 
uh, I can't give the name just yet because of NDA, but uh, they basically have a solution that watches certain smart contracts that control funds. And if any malicious activity happens on those smart contracts, like a malicious transaction trying to do a flash loan, for example, it would alert us. And at that moment, we'll be able to lock the smart contracts and pause it, meaning they can no longer, nobody can no longer move funds, including the hacker, until we resolve the issue. Of course, uh, these are all precautions we say in, in, in motion, um, and we will do our utmost to, to test things rig rigorously before we even go for the security audits. And we aim for 90% uh, security and 90% code coverage in terms of our tests. Uh, it goes through multiple PRs and eventually security audits and then uh, additional security alerting uh, method, method through our partner, which I've described. Um, so with all that, wrapped up i think we'll be in a quite secure support but again code is code right so humans write code and code can contain stakes unfortunately and uh, sometimes the most unexpected hack happens from where you just cannot see it coming um so what we're doing of course in, in right now is keeping up with the news and how these hacks develop and most of these hacks develop seem to be from flash loans so that's something that we're watching out for and we, we're trying to stay well we will stay away from flash loan, there will be no flash loans in Marable, but we will try to limit uh, how flash loans transactions could interact with our smart contracts and minimize that side. Um, so with all that, I think we'll be in a stable place. And then we do have this discussion internally, if we can come up with a Marable Sharia compliant insurance fund to basically cover any potential cost after an exploit. Um, it's still early in discussions, this one, uh, but it, it's, it's another additional solution that we want to provide to our users so they have a peace of mind because at the end of the day, blockchain is a public, uh, public ledger. Anyone can view it, anyone can interact with it, and there's only so much you can do. And if you try to uh, have a too, or too much of a tight grip on the smart contract as the company behind it, then you're losing the side of decentralization and uh, being a DAO, et cetera. So, we need to find the right balance and we need to have a peace of mind for our users, which we, which I believe uh, we have covered through many uh, solutions that was described. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Thank you. Well, Dr. Farouk, my next question just reminds me about the, the second concept that we spoke multiple times. You, you gave a clear explanation about RIBA and then during our discussion, you enlightened us on Mudaraba. So how does Madaraba apply in DeFi in case of Marhaba? And we on Liquidator Harvester, there was a promise about 10% and above in terms of the return. But Madaraba, it's about risk sharing where I don't have um, any sort of legal right to argue with you. If anything goes wrong, can I lose my money? If you could give sort of a couple of case scenarios in terms of Madaraba um, in the context of DeFi and Marhaba and what Nike earlier mentioned about the 10% uh, and above of return. So, okay. Uh, it's not 10% above, it's between 5 to 15%. We'll, we'll never say 10% and above. <laughs> we'll try to keep an under promise and over delivery, inshallah. Hmm. Okay. So actually, Mudaraba or Musharaka, these are actually Islamic partnership contracts. Musharaka is like we, uh, in the, uh, the where we have multiple investors pulling in money and then uh, there are some partners who are managing that fund. In Mudaraba is, is, is a special kind of uh, musharaka or a, a special kind of uh, partnership where one party invest and the other party uh, manages the fund. So we have a segregation of uh, responsibilities and also a segregation of roles. Here. So investor cannot, in, in a Mudarava setting, investor cannot manage the fund, an investor. So it has to, um, uh, the, the manager has to be different from the investor. So how we are going to implement it, for example, in liquidity harvester, people will be coming in as liquidity provider. So they will, they are the investors. They provide the fund, pull the fund into, into the pool uh, and give it to Marhaba DeFi. So Marhaba DeFi will act as, an uh, as a fund manager and then start uh, investing it into, into Sharia compliant uh, liquidity pools. And uh, another fact, another good thing about this uh, investment is that like 
uh, Marhaba DeFi will be constantly looking for the optimized uh, pools, which can give uh, optimized and high returns with the lowest uh, risk. So this is basically the strategy. And uh, also uh, one thing I want to highlight is that uh, uh, the fund which are provided in terms of, uh, in the form of pairs, crypto pairs, they should also be Sharia compliant. So we will also ensure that uh, when we are collecting the funds from the, from the investors in, in the form of pairs, crypto pairs, they, they are also Sharia compliant. Now, this is basically the Sharia compliant rule. Now, because there's this constant, uh, constantly watching out and searching for optimized portfolio, where you have high return but low risk is actually the actually the point where we will be able to have some estimated uh, APY. So estimated is again is uh, I think that it's a it's a very uh, important term which we are using. So we are not promising any sort of return there, in because in Modarba we cannot promise, uh, but we will try our best and with our experience with, with and looking at the whole DeFi world, what we have estimated is that uh, it would be somewhere between 5% to 15%, but there is no promise on that. But of course, we can, we can promise you that like we will try our best to give you the best uh, optimized portfolio of uh, Sharia compliant uh, liquidity pools. So this is basically what we are doing. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you so much for elaboration. Um, Let me yeah. help you, Amir, on your moderation. Maybe I can add a cross question to Denise for the benefit of the crowd. Denise, can you explain how uh, um, Liquidity Harvester would actually get that much of profit just from stablecoin pairing? Sure. So the idea is that we look out for pools that are very lucrative in terms of how much volume is being generated. So if there is a if there is a high amount of volume, then there is a lot more trading fees. Um, and that that would be a pool that we will be targeting. So this this trigger of data uh, consumption from the liquidity harvester backend is continuous. So we'll be doing this every ten to fifteen minutes, right? Because the the liquidity pools and the uh, the amount of volume is continuously changing. So you might have one day, um, God forbid, Teva turns out to be an uh, unbacked currency everybody will want to exit Teva, right? So then we will have a pool where we see that ETH versus USDC would become very lucrative. So we will please start moving funds to that pool to generate as much as fees possible for our users. And the more funds you have, uh, we have as Marhaba, the management fund, the, the more ownership of that pool we own and that therefore the more LP tokens we own as the, as the management fund. So because of the large share, we, we get more of the fees that are generated. The fees are obviously Sharia compliant because it, it's basically trading fees. It's like using an exchange where instead of Binance taking everything as a centralized entity, this time the entire community is yeah, making, making money because everybody shares the profits. And uh, on that side, um, we will continue, as I said, to poll different uh, pools across different chains. It's not just a single EVM chain, Ethereum or Avalanche. Our bridges and our connection, uh, which is what the Trailblazer API is going to be doing, is continuously pour, uh, p p ping different pools on different chains and start bridging funds uh, necessarily to wherever. Um, where it gets really interesting is actually version two, because version one is it's non-custodial, meaning you can withdraw your funds whenever you want. But uh, yeah, and it's work with stable coins. So we would support USDT, USDC pair, for example. Or, um, but uh, where it gets interesting is version two, when we take on altcoins, which are Sharia compliant. Obviously, this is high risk. Those depends on the user's type. But if you're, if you're risk averse and you don't mind um, sort of taking on that risk and taking on the impermanent loss and the risk on top of it as well, you could be making a much, much larger return in terms of fees because... If, for example, yeah, let's take a look at um, ETH slash QNT, QNT is another type of coin, on Uniswap, it's generating around 30 to 35% per year returns on fees, just liquidity. So if you can take on the risk and say, okay, I'm not going to sell these tokens, I might as well just utilize them in some way, 
regardless of how much the price fluctuates and keep it for a year, then you're looking at 30 to 35 percent returns on uh, of months and on other assets so could actually grow in value because you're technically holding you're not selling anything. So um, with version two, that becomes um, quite high risk, but quite high returns as well. That that's that's basically how it's going to work in a nutshell. It's a lot of data consumption, a lot of back and forth between different chains. Okay, okay, that, that's very promising, very compelling, and very tentative idea. Um, well, before we wind up, I think um, every and think every one of you might have some kind of concluding statements. Maybe you're looking for new employees. Maybe you have some ideas that we have to think about. Maybe you're looking for new investors. You might have some kind of one minute pitch, if you will. Um, anything to, to conclude on a positive note. Maybe Dr. Farouk. And so uh, as a closing remarks, I can basically say that uh, uh, Marhaba DeFi is a promising project. Uh, in the sense that uh, it is uh, the first Sharia compliant DeFi project. And uh, I think that uh, what we are doing right now is, uh, is something groundbreaking uh, because uh, it is not only in terms of uh, uh, introducing ethics, social values and Islamic religious values into the DeFi space, but also we are also doing a lot of research and, uh, uh, and uh, and a lot of work in terms of understanding the fiqh, Islamic fiqh itself, and then driving uh, the Sharia rulings for, for DeFi space. So this is basically a very uh, challenging, but at the same time, uh, uh, very much, uh, I could say, like the innovative uh, practice. And uh, I think that uh, the community should support it because it's not only because that they will be able to uh, reap some uh, financial benefits, but also because like it's a, it's an experiment, uh, a social experiment, an ethical experiment, and then it will open doors for other innovation and uh, other uh, practices and other products and services, which would be way, way beneficial for the whole society. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Pro. Um, Denise, maybe you could give a couple of concluding points. Yeah, sure. So just to add to Dr. Farouk, on top of that, um, I would say to the general community, not just the Muslim community, those who are basically uh, conscious of how they how they uh, invest and how they reap the rewards, um, I would say take a look at the white paper, see what we're proposing as a solution, read up on it. Don't be so skeptical because of the word Sharia, because Sharia has a for some reason in in especially where I am in Europe has a negative connotation to it. But um, it's more than what people think it is. It, 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 Sharia is good finance, good economy, in my opinion. And um, for the community who wants to get involved, I would say take the leap of faith, get involved. I know crypto can be scary and it is full of, unfortunately, scams as an as an, as a, as a industry in its infancy. But legitimate projects like us will only grow this space. And if you don't take part in it, unfortunately, you will be um, excluded from the growth of this sector um, just like how uh, we, we were excluded up until now uh, based on the interest riba based system well once again on behalf of organizing team synopsis 2021 specifically on Sinophi behalf we want to thank you for your time very fantastic journey we admire your courage the fact that you are challenging the status quo it's a, it's a groundbreaking project we will be supporting in, along the way. And thank you once again, and see you in our next panels. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you so much, Amir. Thank, thank you, you so for the opportunity. Yeah. We help fund, build, and localize tech startups in the world's most promising regions. Cinefy is a one-stop solution for tech companies trying to make sense of China and Southeast Asia. Check out more at cinefy.group. Current revenue generating methods don't allow publishers and businesses to offer an enjoyable ad-free browsing experience. We need a new solution that brings everything together to benefit businesses and users alike. That's why we made Gather. 
Gather is a blockchain-based network that improves the online experience for users, generates additional revenue for publishers, reduces cloud computing costs for enterprises, and makes running a proof-of-work blockchain easier. Instead of spamming users with ads to generate revenue, Gather runs in the background of your site and with each user's consent, aggregates their idle processing power. Then it distributes said power to enterprises for cloud computing and to developers for cryptocurrency mining. Publishers receive payment in cryptocurrency or fiat, users get to enjoy an ad-free browsing experience, and developers deploy their secure blockchains without the need to find new miners. Ultimately, it's a virtuous cycle that radically changes digital monetization and revenue generation to provide a superior experience for the end user. Join Gather today to be a part of the future. We help fund, build, and localize tech startups in the world's most promising regions. Cinefy is a one-stop solution for tech companies trying to make sense of China and Southeast Asia. Check out more at cinefy.group. So, the next interview speaker is Zahir Ibrahimov, the CEO at Islam Invest Influencer and CSAA. So, and the moderator of this speech is Tanya Vasanina. Здравствуйте, с нами сегодня Закир Ибрагимов, эксперт в области инвестирования по шариатским стандартам, основатель проекта инвестиций в исламе, а также официальный представитель платформы Marhaba DeFi в России СНГ. Здравствуйте, Закир. Здравствуйте, Татьяна. Закир, расскажите, ваш образовательный проект занимается исключительно инвестированием в рамках исламского закона. Чем такое инвестирование отличается от инвестирования в традиционном понимании этого слова? Ключевое отличие заключается в двух вещах, двух основу таких основополагающих вещах. Первое – это мы инвестируем в компании, которые по понятным причинам не дозволены, точнее, мы не инвестируем в компании, в которые не дозволены инвестировать мусульманам. Это, это компании, которые так иначе связаны с производством алкоголя, каких-то недозволенных вещей, не знаю, там, сигарет и так далее, и так далее. Но помимо этого в исламе есть очень такой важный запрет на ростовщичество. И, соответственно, в исламе строго запрещены любые сделки, связанные с какими-то процентными отношениями. И возникает вопрос, опять же, когда мы говорим про инвестиции в акции, например, как быть с теми компаниями, которые занимаются дозволенным видом бизнеса, вроде бы там, качают, добывают нефть и так далее, но при этом работают с коммерческими банками, берут деньги под проценты, либо кладут деньги под проценты. Соответственно, для того, чтобы решить этот вопрос, мусульманскими учеными были выпущены специальные шариатские стандарты, то есть это группа ученых, которая разработала определенные шариатские стандарты, указали определенные параметры, критерии, и используя эти критерии, у мусульман появляется возможность инвестировать в акции вот таких вот смешанных компаний. И таких критерий Несколько, то есть есть определенные стандарты, которым мы, использовать которые мы обучаем наших братьев и сестер мусульман. И на самом деле с практической точки зрения получается, что эти стандарты, эти критерии, они дают на самом деле даже больше, скажем так, больше экономического преимущества для инвесторов. Почему? Потому что, например, когда мы говорим про долги, 
мусульмане не могут инвестировать, вот по этим шариатским стандартам, они не могут инвестировать в компании, у которых долги превышают определенные показатели. И если задать вопрос, а какая компания является наиболее подверженной банкротству? Ну, ответ очевидный, да, напрашивается сам собой, это компании, у которых высокие долги. Соответственно, мусульмане, получается, что автоматически, используя вот эти вот шариатские фильтры, шариатские стандарты, автоматически не инвестируют в компании, которые подвержены банкротству, к примеру. Соответственно, это, это вот одна часть, один аспект. Ну и второй аспект, очень важный, на мой взгляд, на мой субъективный взгляд, даже, наверное, намного более важнее, чем первый аспект, про который я говорил. Мусульмане не могут заниматься спекуляциями потому что спекуляции, азартные игры, они очень строго запрещены в религии ислам. И, безусловно, на сегодняшний день само вот это понятие спекуляции, трейдинг, оно довольно размыто. Довольно размыто, и мало кто использует спекуляции. Да? Все говорят, мы занимаемся там трейдингом. По сути, там покупаем и продаем какие-то финансовые инструменты, акции и прочее. И мусульманские ученые не запрещают этого делать. То есть мусульманские ученые говорят, да, окей, трейдинг, он дозволен. То есть можно, покуп... можно относиться, например, к акциям компании как к товару. Можно покупать и продавать акции компании. Но здесь вот эта грань размывается, и люди это воспринимают как, ага, значит, я могу там условно покупать и продавать, и делать это постоянно, и фактически вот играть на разнице цены, на колебаниях вот этих вот цен. Ну и моя задача – доносить людям информацию, почему это все-таки не дозволено для мусульман, и мое субъективное мнение, я убежден в этом вопросе, что нельзя заниматься спекуляциями, в этом, в этом, нет, в этом нет никакого никакой экономической целесообразности. Я считаю, что все-таки, когда речь идет о том, что ты что-то покупаешь, либо продаешь, ты должен, должен вносить какую-то экономическую ценность, должен вносить что-то более фундаментальное, чем просто там купля-продажа и игра на разнице цены. В, во втором случае, то есть если ты просто играешь на разницу цены, по большому счету это начинает превращаться в азартную игру. А, и я как человек, который в свое время занимал очень высокую должность в сети гостиницы казино, я <laughs> хорошо понимаю, о чем я говорю. Я очень хорошо знаю вот эти вот э, и с точки зрения ощущений, и с точки зрения отношения. Я знаю, что такое азартные игры. И Абсолютно убежден, что для любого человека будет намного больше пользы, если он будет правильно относиться к рынкам, если он будет инвестором, если он будет инвестировать в долгосрочный value, то есть да, в долгосрочные какие-то ценности, и не тратить свое время на то, чтобы заниматься азартными играми. Вот это если вкратце. Mm -hmm. То есть вот вы говорили про запрет на процентную ставку, риба она называется. Риба, да. Да, то есть она тоже, по сути, приравнивается к спекуляции и чему-то азартному. Поэтому Нет, она... это, это, это все-таки два разных понятия. И спекуляция – это мейсир или хмар. То есть это именно азартная игра, игра с, с вероятностью проигрыша или полного проигрыша для, одной из, для одного из участников, для одной из сторон. Рыба – это деньги под процент. То есть всякий раз, когда включаются какие-то инструменты, где есть вознаграждение просто за то, что одна сторона хранит у себя или берет в долг, или использует деньги и не несет никаких рисков, и, соответственно, говорит, что, допустим, да, я беру у вас деньги, допустим, на год, и, допустим, за течение этого года хорошо у меня дела, плохо у меня дела, неважно, я вам должен выплатить там условно 5 либо 10 процентов от стоимости, от общей стоимости этих денег. Соответственно, вот это вот как раз таки тот самый ростовщический процент. Когда нет разделения рисков и вознаграждения, когда одна сторона берет на себя полностью все риски, более того, еще и берет на себя обязательство выплатить какую-то прибыль, независимо от того, что у этой стороны этой прибыли может вовсе не быть. И ну, под это определение, например, очень четко подходят облигации. Облигации как раз-таки это рыба, это именно ростовщический инструмент, где одна сторона, то есть обладатель денег не берет на себя никакие риски и просто дает эти деньги тому, кому он посчитает нужным, под определенный процент, 
прибыли обратно. Вот такие вот сделки в исламе запрещены. Я хотел сказать, не поощряются, но они точно не поощряются. Они по факту запрещены определенными аятами из священного Хурана, определенными хадисами от нашего пророка Мухаммеда, саваллаху алейкум. А, ну вот а как с точки зрения именно шариата, почему это плохо? Потому что одна страна берет на себя всю ответственность и, или потому что одна страна бездействует, там, а другой, другая должна что-то делать? Ну то есть потому что в бизнесе есть а, такое понятие, что ну, инвестор, человек, у которого есть деньги, он вкладывает эти деньги и деньги работают на него, а он отдыхает. Почему вот в исламе это по-другому по -другому работает? Ну да, на самом деле, если даже не то, что с точки зрения ислама, если даже посмотреть сейчас в мире, я не знаю, насколько вы, скажем так, разбираетесь в вопросах мировой экономики, мы видим, что когда у, у, у одного человека или у группы лиц в руках появляется этот инструмент, и, соответственно, у них за счет того, что у них больше денег, чем у остальных, у них появляется, во-первых, возможность манипулировать всеми остальными, начинает у тех людей, у которых сосредоточена власть или финансы, у них отсутствует мотивация для того, чтобы развиваться, для того, чтобы создавать какие-то инновации. Нет смысла там, быть конкурентоспособными. Потому что и власть, и деньги начинают концентрироваться в руках одних людей. И ну, мы исторически видим очень много таких примеров. Соответственно, если э, э, один человек аккумулирует у себя все деньги и начинает их просто раздавать под проценты, то возникает неравенство, соответственно, тоже. Да, безусловно, с точки зрения бизнеса э, очень много можно каких-то альтернативных примеров привести. Действительно, с точки зрения бизнеса, давать деньги в долг и таким образом финансировать какой-то бизнес, это очень распространенный на сегодняшний день инструмент. И более того, кто-то скажет, что нет, сегодняшние процентные ставки, они очень низкие. И несмотря на то, что инвестор, который дает деньги в долг под проценты, под очень низкий процент, несмотря на то, что он вроде как бы не берет на себя риски, но тем не менее... С учетом того, что эти процентные ставки, они, они очень низкие, по факту этот риск, он равномерно распределяется между всеми участниками. Да, это всякие разные доводы можно приводить, но с точки зрения религии и ислама это запретно, потому что это, ну, эти, эти инструменты, вот эти ростовщические инструменты, они в итоге делают одних людей богаче, при этом э, совершенно отсутствует какая-то мотивация развиваться и делает бедных людей беднее. Вот ключевое вот это вот. Да, я поняла. То есть это больше про такой баланс, равновесие, его поддержание. Да. Хорошо, тогда а вот объясните или расскажите нашей аудитории, как шариат относится к биткоину и криптовалюте. Потому что с ростовщичеством это понятно, это уже достаточно ну, как бы старое явление, оно появилось ну, давно, но биткоин и криптовалюта – это что-то новое, вот. А комплекс шариатских законов был создан в VII веке, если я не ошибаюсь. Вот. И как это все трактуется? Смотрите, первоочередно мы должны с вами поднять одну вещь. С точки зрения исламского права, с точки зрения исламского фика, все, что, все на, на чего нет прямого запрета в Коране либо в Сунне, оно является автоматически дозволенным. Есть такая максима да, в исламском фике ли бахатель муамалят фил асад. То есть все, что не запрещено прямыми текстами, оно автоматически дозволено. Соответственно, вот, вот этот вот момент, вот эту максимум мы всегда должны держать в уме. Мнение ученых касательно биткоина и касательно в целом вот эти технологии блокчейн, распределенных денег и так далее, оно разделилось в мире. Часть ученых, и причем понятно, что когда вся эта тема только начала развиваться, некоторые ученые, причем довольно сильные ученые, да, например, Шавки Алям, великий муфти Египта, очень сильный ученый мировой и так далее, там определенные органы мусульманские стали выпускать фетвы о том, что это не дозволено. Ну и 
там есть пять основных причин, то, что это не контролируется никаким государством, ну, в частности, биткоин, то, что значит, не является какой-то официальной платежной системой биткоин, ну, давайте сейчас про биткоин говорить, да? биткоин это, собственно, первая криптовалюта и вообще в целом феномен. Далее там было то, что, значит, эти инструменты, в частности, биткоин, высоко волатильны и, соответственно, подвержены спекуляциям. Четвертое, то, что можно использовать для каких-то незаконных сделок, то есть можно анонимно оплачивать, там, я не знаю, там, поставки оружия там, или еще чего-то. И пятое, пятое сейчас вылетело из головы, но ну, тоже вот из этой серии. Но э, другая часть ученых, и их голоса становятся все слышны все громче, говорят о том, что э, эти причины, они не могут э, быть достаточными для того, чтобы называть биткоин запретом. Потому что те же причины можно соотнести к традиционным, допустим, фиатным валютам или к традиционным финансовым инструментам, которые тоже являются высоковолатильными. Доллар США с таким же успехом можно использовать для там, я не знаю, оплаты там, оружия там, или еще чего-то запретного. И с точки зрения того, что биткоин не является официальной платежной системой и не регулируется государством, аргумент такой, что золото – тоже для того, чтобы золото существовало как деньги, не обязательно, чтобы оно регулировалось каким-то там государством. Золото принадлежит всему человечеству. Это, опять же, такой децентрализованный инструмент, да, имеющий какую-то внутреннюю ценность, внутреннюю, внутреннюю денежность. Ну и, соответственно, вот такие вот контраргументы, которые ну, звучат, в общем-то, довольно весомо и mm -hmm. обоснованно. И согласно этому, ну, уже на самом деле есть фетвы. Есть фетва от э, Шариатского консультативного совета Малайзии, есть фетва от э, совета по фиху э, Северной Америки. То есть выпускаются уже фетвы. Это я даже я говорю помимо мнений там, о каких-то определенных отдельных ученых, которые выпускают свои фетвы, выпускают документы, которые обосновывают то, что нельзя говорить, что биткоин запретен или, или соответственно, какие-то любые другие проекты. Про эфириум, про эфириум есть тоже очень такой объемный документ группы ученых э, сделанный, э, где они обосновывают все положения и тоже говорят, что нельзя называть э, запретными эти новые современные инструменты. Угу, поняла. А, тогда вот а, такой вопрос. В чем разница между инвестированием в криптовалюту и зарабатыванием на криптовалюте? Хороший вопрос, и как раз-таки вот у меня есть курс, называется «Крипты в исламе», где я, в том числе мусульман, обучаю тому, как правильно к этому относиться, и это одна из вот этих вот тем, которые я затрагиваю. Дело в том, что что в области там, инвестирования в акции, что в области инвестирования в криптовалюты, я не вижу никакого смысла нигде тратить свое время на то, чтобы заниматься спекуляцией. И я от всей души призываю каждого человека, который готов тратить время на то, чтобы заниматься спекуляциями, а любой трейдер, любой трейдер вам скажет, что если ты хочешь делать это хорошо, я, я не преувеличиваю, нужно заниматься этим 24 на 7. Любой трейдер вам скажет, да, для того, чтобы хорош, быть хорошим трейдером, ты должен быть в курсе всего, у тебя, на тебя должно там нависнуть 25 мониторов, которые будут транслировать тебе, ты все должен быть в курсе всех, <laughs> всего и вся, что происходит в мире, да, и как бы держать руку на пульсе, все. Другое момент, что ты через 7 лет такой работы в целом уже можешь потихонечку на пенсию отправляться, да, но э, я к чему это говорю? Если есть время и такое огромное желание там, что изучать, Слушайте, ну, э, куча сейчас есть э, курсов бесплатных, где вас обучат начальным азам программирования, например, на Ethereum. И сейчас ведь как это все делается? Я не программист, но даже я знаю, что это сейчас все как лего. Это уже какие-то готовые решения. Вы можете сложить это с этим, получите это и так далее, и так далее. И я уже даже сам со своей точки зрения уже вижу, что на это есть спрос. 
То есть все больше и больше предпринимателей начинают понимать, как можно вот эти вот технологии, блокчейн использовать в своем бизнесе, как улучшать. Ведь в итоге, в конце концов, любая технология, почему она начинает работать и почему она становится быть нужна человечеству? Потому что она приводит к удешевлению процессов. Любая технология, любой прорыв, любой disruption, он удешевляет процессы, и он делает товары, услуги, все, все, что мы потребляем, еще дешевле. И это, безусловно, можно ну, применить к любому бизнесу. Так вот, я как бизнесмен, как предприниматель вижу и понимаю, что все больше и больше людей будут говорить, слушай, а реально, касса это работает вот так вот, если я здесь вот это вот с этим сложу, то у меня в бизнесе это там не даст минус там, 10%. Ну или плюс 10%, да? то есть минус 10% расходов, соответственно, плюс 10% прибыли. И такие специалисты нужны будут, они будут востребованы, которые как минимум будут во всем этом разбираться, которые смогут прийти в любой бизнес и сказать, так, давайте я вам сейчас вот это 2 плюс 2 сложу, там все это красиво вам построю. И, и, и самое главное, есть курсы, которые бесплатно готовы обучать, и даже там они дают сертификат, если ты хорошо все сделал, там выполнился домашнее задание и так далее, и так далее. Вот есть все там сертификации по Ethereum, например. И это в интернете все это можно найти, то есть это в общем доступе есть. Поэтому вот это я считаю зарабатывать. Вот это я считаю зарабатывать, вот это я считаю реально потратить свое время, приобрести какие-то новые навыки. И я думаю, что за такими людьми, которые хорошо будут во всем этом разбираться, будут очереди из работодателей. А инвестировать, ну, сам, сама структура блокчейна дает нам ответ на вопрос, как лучше всего нам инвестировать. Если самая лучшая стратегия в акции – это покупать акции, инвестировать долгосрочно и получать дивиденды, то в блокчейне самое лучшее – это поддерживать сеть, покупая, допустим, монеты, криптовалюты, да, нативные токены, неважно, и поддерживая консенсус сети. Сейчас с переходом с Proof of Work на Proof of Stake ну, очень многие блокчейны дают возможность становиться валидаторами да, или форжерами того или иного блокчейна. Соответственно, мне кажется, вот это самый классный способ. Если вам действительно понравился блокчейн, действительно понравился проект, вы видите, ну, я знаете, я вот на личном опыте всегда говорю, у э, действительно крутых бизнесменов, у них есть такой дар э, предвидения. Да, это называется, э, э, они, они умеют э, видеть какие-то вещи. Э, у них есть vision. И э, там, когда я работал ну, с одним из людей, который на меня произвел, произвел очень большое, большое впечатление, один из моих менторов, э, это как раз вот это сеть гостиницы и казино, про которую я говорил. Это владелец этой сети казино. Мы очень так э, плотно вместе работали. И они, конечно, эти люди, они визионеры. И я прям, я просто вижу, да, он там включает, начинает что-то рассказывать. И если его внимательно слушать и прям вот э, э, вжиться в то, что он говорит, то можно видеть. У него прям на глазах растут там целые города, я не знаю, там здания появляются, да, вот это все, то есть, когда они рассказывают, вот у них есть вот этот вот vision, да, они, они визионеры. И, соответственно, когда вы инвестируете во что-то, обязательно должен быть вот этот вот vision. Мы, к сожалению, люди очень падки на вот это вот быстрее заработать, больше всех заработать, там, проспекулировать, чисто проехаться, там, купить дешево, продать дороже, не вкладывая в это никакой смысл, не вкладывая в это никакую ценность. И результат, он даже, может быть, и придет, но как он пришел, так он быстро уходит. Все-таки вкладываться всегда надо, инвестировать надо в ценность, инвестироваться надо в картинку. И если вы эту картинку для себя... А когда у вас будет картинка? Например, какой-то новый проект. Когда она у вас будет? Когда вы сделали свою домашнюю работу хорошо, вы изучили проект, вы поняли суть проекта, вы поняли реально, что он нужен, или, может быть, вы поняли, что он не нужен и замечательный, значит, вы сделали свою домашнюю работу хорошо. Так или иначе, какой бы у вас ни был ответ, главное, чтобы у вас был вот здесь вот очень крепкий стержень и понимание того, что нужно это вам и человечеству или нет. Если нужно, тогда поддерживаем фундаментально, конкретно. Заходим, становимся форджерами, валидаторами, поддерживаем сеть, участвуем в консенсусе сети и, соответственно, с этого зарабатываем. Ну и таких инструментов ведь несколько. Можно еще и предоставлять liquidity mining, например, на децентрализованных биржах. Опять же, 
покупая, инвестируя в ту монету, которая вам понравилась. Соответственно, это вот инвестиции. Инвестиции – это когда вы используете те инструменты, которые есть для поддержания сети в том или ином виде, предоставляя ликвидность, поддерживая консенсус сети и так далее. И так далее. А зарабатывать – это когда вы э, приобретаете необходимые навыки базовые, Потому что если вы приобретете базовые навыки и начнете в этом развиваться, то ну, сама жизнь вас дальше будет толкать вверх. И будут появляться новые возможности, новые какие-то навыки, которые можно изучить и начинать их внедрять, там, применять и так далее. Вот касательно картинки и выжим, как вы сказали, вы официальный представитель проекта Marha Badify в России СНГ. Расскажите, почему вы стали частью этого проекта? Какую картинку вы увидели? Да, это хороший вопрос. На самом деле мне часто тоже говорили, вот, а ведь действительно там, блокчейн, вот эти все технологии, они дают такие классные возможности. Почему типа не создать какой-то там свой блокчейн-проект? Мне говорили люди. И Интересно, я так вот слушал и задавал себе сам вопрос, хорошо, а почему не приходят идеи? Ну, идеи действительно не приходили, а да? создавать там проект ради проекта, ну, ну альхамдуля, да, слава богу, ну, реально, да, это не про меня. Да? То есть у меня так достаточно проектов, очень высокая занятость, но я надеялся и понимал, что должен появиться какой-то проект похоже на Мархабадефай. И более того, я понимал, что в мире очень много мусульман, которые, ну вот, как минимум даже не то, что у них нет возможности вникнуть в это. То есть те, у кого есть возможность, они начинают изучать. Ведь если на самом деле сейчас вот так вот все выключить, да, и сказать просто там русскоговорящему, допустим, человеку, начать изучать эту тему, мне легко, потому что я владею английским языком. Да, это, это такая милость Всевышнего по отношению ко мне. И э, поверьте мне, если бы я не знал английского языка, я не думаю, что я там, владел бы таким объемом информации, которым я владею, э, обладая этими знаниями. И, соответственно, а есть люди, которые, я не знаю, там, даже русским там не владеют, да, допустим. То есть получается на них еще меньше э, ограничений по информации идет. И многие у нас, например, с Узбекистана тоже пишут, типа, а что у вас там все на русском, когда там будет на, на узбекском языке? Ну, допустим, да? И вы представляете, сколько людей таких по всему миру? Соответственно, появление Мархаба Дефай как исламской платформы, именно первой в мире децентрализованной платформы по исламским финансам, она дает доступ к таким людям, которые могут сказать, что окей, там есть ученые, ученые мусульманские, то есть это шариатский комитет, Значит, эта платформа нам говорит о том, что все инструменты, которые есть, они уже проверены, они дозволены. Мне не нужно там париться о том, что дозволено это или нет. И Мархаба Дефай планируется как инклюзив, да, как, как такой максимально доступный всем людям, да, максимально доступны всем людям по всей планете, ну и в частности мусульманам, причем они ведь не ограничиваются мусульманами, они говорят инклюзив, то есть это для всех. И здесь идет упора как раз таки и на вот эту вот ethical, да, на этическую часть. То есть люди, которые будут использовать кошелек этой платформы, использовать инструменты этой платформы, будут знать, что с точки зрения этики, с точки зрения каких-то вот запретов религиозных, они максимально все делают по шариату. И мы должны понимать, что в мире сейчас по 2 миллиарда мусульман. Соответственно, если даже 10-5% от этого населения просто пойдут в Мархаба, потому что это там, первый в мире исламский, исламская экосистема децентрализованных финансов, то это даст большой буст. Даст большой буст. И я думаю, что это будет востребовано просто. Это, по-моему, так очевидно. Это будет востребовано. И поэтому я увидел в этом... Тут еще ведь наложилось. Я в целом являюсь таким сторонником децентрализации. Я всегда очень простой пример привожу. Мне кажется, что не то, что кажется, а по факту так оно и есть. Доллар США, который является, собственно, резервной валютой да, всего мира, и на самом деле все остальные валюты отталкиваются от доллара США, он с точки зрения своей функции денег, функцию сбережения выполняет очень плохо. Потому что у меня все время перед глазами стоит пример родителей, которые в Ташкенте в 90-х годах за 7 тысяч долларов купили квартиру. 
трехкомнатную квартиру за 7 тысяч долларов. И если бы они эти деньги положили просто под подушку, то сегодня они бы точно никакую квартиру там не купили. То есть эта квартира по стоимости сейчас 10 раз выросла. Это тысяча процентов. Соответственно, можно просто представить за вот этот вот, ну, в общем-то, короткий срок, по большому счету, сколько доллар потерял стоимость. Поэтому с этой точки зрения фиатные деньги, опять же, да, это, это инструмент определенной группы лиц. И как только власть кому-то попадает, люди начинают эту власть так или иначе узурпировать. И это огромная тема, если я сейчас начну эту тему говорить, мы, конечно, ненадолго здесь засядем. Как бы с учетом вот всех этих вещей, я в целом считаю, что децентрализация – это милость создателя по отношению к человечеству. Просто главное, чтобы люди правильно, умело использовали эти инструменты и получали пользу не только для себя, но и родных, близких и для человечества в целом. Угу. Ну и вот в заключение хотела у вас спросить. Вы писали в своем телеграм-канале, что мусульманам стоит научиться воспринимать криптовалюту и блокчейн не как способ быстрого заработка, а как технологию, которая способна полностью кардинально изменить жизнь на планете Земля. Вот как вы видите этот процесс, какие изменения будут происходить? Ну, это вот, опять же, коррелирует с тем, что я уже сейчас привел как примеры, да, опять же, про тот же доллар, например, и так далее. И вот сейчас даже просто банально не надо никуда уходить. Мы все время что-то вот начинаем себе усложнять, а вот и представлять, а как оно будет так или вот всяк. Если сейчас просто взять даже историю того же биткоина, то мы видим, что любой человек на любом этапе, который понял, что это такое, и сказал, слушай, прикольная тема, буду-ка я держать там доллар, два, пять, десять в этом биткоине, Любой человек, который решил, что он будет делать так, он сегодня в большом плюсе. И э, мы люди, на самом деле, находясь вот в этой э, гонке за тем, чтобы, если, интересно, если задать себе такой глубинный, фундаментальный вопрос, э, вопрос намерения, да, у нас в исламе намерение – это одно из самых главных вещей. Наш пророк э, Мухаммед, Саллаху алейкум ассаляму, мир ему благословение Всевышнего Создателя. Он всегда, у него есть он говорит, все от намерений. То есть, что бы вы ни делали, всегда спрашивайте себя свое намерение. И намерение людей, вот с точки зрения того, чтобы заработать, с точки зрения того, чтобы сделать какую-то прибыль, оно всегда крутится вот вокруг вот этого вот, вот мелочного, вокруг вот этой вот спекуляции, вокруг того, чтобы люди не смотрят на биткоин, как на инструмент, который реально может сберечь их труд, сберечь, что такое деньги? Деньги – это, по сути, проекция того, что вы вложили в этот мир. И мы деньги так или иначе зарабатываем. Соответственно, тратим свое время, энергию, свою жизнь. Мы тратим свою жизнь, отдаем свою жизнь там, на пользу чего-то, и за это получаем вознаграждение. И если смотреть на это как на инструмент для того, чтобы это быстренько как-то приумножить, заработать вот на этом движении вверх либо вниз. И, и что? Как бы ничего. Это, это ложная цель. Это неправильное намерение. Но если смотреть на это как на технологию, которая является децентрализованной, которая дает возможность сберечь ценность и смотреть на это долгосрочно, то ну, тектонические сдвиги начнутся просто по всей планете. И если люди реально правильно начнут к этому относиться, правильно э, применять, то польза, которую, от всего, которую мы можем получить от всего этого, она будет колоссальной. Поэтому э, и у мусульман это большая проблема. Я, я в целом считаю, что вот мы, мусульмане, на сегодняшний день очень сильно заморочены тем, чтобы заработать. Хотя, между прочим, Всевышний Аллах Тааля, Господь Всемогущий, нам сказал, что наш удел, он предопределен. То есть от голоду вы в любом случае не умрете. Вам нужно жить, созидать, творить, приносить пользу этому миру и увеличивать свой удел. То есть сделать так, чтобы ваша жизнь становилась лучше, чтобы у вас были больше возможностей и так далее, и так далее. А тот удел, который у нас есть, он уже предопределен. И, кстати, именно по этим причинам, ведь Господь говорит, там, не, не 
не, огранич, не ограничивать себя в детях, например. Да, вот у нас у людей есть вот там, допустим, два ребенка, ой, там третьего как прокормлю и так далее, и так далее. Сейчас в этом в целом да, у человечества есть такой вот, такая проблема. Хотя нам Всевышний говорит, что и, и удел, который вашим детям, тоже я даю. Он тоже предопределен. И вам просто остается жить, созидать и еще больше получать милости, еще больше получать наград от Всевышнего Создателя. Соответственно, мусульманам, я считаю, нужно вот перестроить мышление и быть любознательным. Знаете, к сожалению, мы не, мы, мы не идем там в авангарде истории в том плане, что не мы создаем эти новые технологии, не мы создаем какие-то disruptive технологии, технологии, которые разрывают, разрывают пространство между прошлым и будущим. К сожалению, не мусульмане. Да, это все исходит из Запада. И там люди в этом плане, может быть, даже больше мусульмане. Они любознательны, они хотят творить, они хотят что-то создавать. Они живут этой жизнью, живут там полной грудью и, и берут от этой жизни все. А, а мы заморочены. Там, пойду на экономиста. Для чего? Чтобы денег заработать. Пойду на юриста. Для чего? Чтобы денег побольше заработать. Понимаете? И ведь на самом деле, если любому человеку задашь, он идет на юриста не для того, чтобы создать какие-то супер, написать законы, которые изменят жизнь человечества к лучшему или там, жизнь граждан в отдельно взятой стране. У подавляющего большинства людей заморот как получить профессию или что-то, или какие-то знания, чтобы на этом бабки зарабатывать. Вот мне кажется, как только вот это мышление начнет меняться, то мы реально в целом, мы как люди и как нация сможем делать какие-то действительно по-настоящему глобальные вещи в мире. Закир, спасибо большое за беседу, за ваше видение, что вы поделились очень ценными, интересными мыслями. Спасибо большое вам, Таня. Хорошего вечера. И вам. So, the second English day of Synopsis 2021 edition 3 has ended. Uh, let me thank all viewers and brilliant speakers for joining us. My special thanks to co-host Andersan Roberto, Nastya Adamova, and Tanya Vasinina. I would like to mention that summer organizers as a blockchain consultancy group, Calibri Group, the cryptocurrency calendar, Coindar.org, and Sinophy Group. Summit organizers as a commission of blockchain technologies and digital economy of the all Russian public organization, Investment Russia, and popular YouTube channels, Cryptos, and Saxon BDC. Our diamond sponsors are Algorand and ARPACHAIN. Our gold sponsors are Gazer, Bella Protocol, CPI Technologies, Bioeconomy, and Veracity. Our key partners are Exmo, Theta Network, and Theta.tv, Freeton, and Tom Labs, Dahlia, Blockster, Fear.io, Estar, DigiDAO, DAO.vc, Bing Crypto, Bing Bond, J2TX, Trustbase, KIO, and of course, Binance. Synopsis 2021 has opened the interactive zone under the Synergy section at Coindar.org, where cryptocurrency projects hold contents and quizzes. So visit Coindar.org and join them. There are puzzles waiting for you. Uh, by the way, tomorrow will be the final English day at the Synopsis 2021, and it will be amazing as well. <laughs> so I'm a Maxim Sofanasik. See you tomorrow.
We help fund, build, and localize tech startups in the world's most promising regions. Cinefy is a one-stop solution for tech companies trying to make sense of China and Southeast Asia. Check out more at cinefy.group. Welcome to the Theta Network. Earn T-Fuel crypto rewards simply by watching live streams and videos. As you watch and share with others, you're contributing to the decentralized Theta Network, all powered by Theta's native blockchain. Discover the future of video delivery at thetanetwork.org. and bulls are the two driving forces of the crypto market depending on who buys and who sells the bear is superpower is to make money even when the market is down their strategy is selling short and provoking a supply increase the bull the whole bull's life is dealings for a rise his main goal is a growing market bull is optimistic and pluckily beats first The confrontation of bulls and bears lasts forever, and as its price depends on who leads the fight. Exmo, choose the strategy 